Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Spring 2024 IPO Bootcamp. My name is Colin Mahan, and I'm the Director of Programs at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. And for those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit that's building a better path for entrepreneurs worldwide by improving inclusion, access, and knowledge in entrepreneurship. As you're going to see in the chat in just a moment, the NASDAQ Center provides programs, resources, and exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, and geographies. So check out those links and resources in the chat. Now I've got some housekeeping items before we get started. Firstly, let us know where you're dialing in from in the chat. See if you have any neighbors. Secondly, we're gonna open up for live Q&A at the end of each panel. So please submit those questions for us in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout each session. We'll try our best to get to them all. Now, none of what we do here at the center would be possible without all the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Emo, Airbnb, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Woodruff Sawyer, BPM, HubSpot for, and HubSpot for Startups. We're humbled by their contributions and hope you're grateful too. Now, I'm going to launch a couple of polls to take a step back and take a temperature gauge on how all of you are doing today. We use this information to guide the wellness programs we provide for our entrepreneurs. So the first one, how are you feeling about your business? Are you feeling a healthy dose of optimism? Are you feeling a little anxiety? Let us know. All right, thank you for voting. Looks like there is a healthy dose of optimism. So we're gonna end that poll, share those results. Looks like there's a little bit of survival mode out there and a little anxiety, but hopefully our presentations today will help with some of that sentiment. The second poll I'm gonna launch is what's keeping you up at night? Again, we use this information to guide the next couple months of programming to help you, the entrepreneurs that we are serving. So let's see what those results, thank you for voting. Looks like finance is in the lead. Uh, followed by sales and scale. All righty. Well, let's end that poll and share those results. Finance is in the lead. Well, you're in the right place because our presentations today will cover a ton of that. So lastly, before we get started, please take a look at our agenda for the day. We're going to kick off our program with an IPO market update and then jump to our first panel, preparing for and staying on track for your IPO, followed by a quick break. Then we're gonna transition into our second panel where our panelists will share insights on executing your IPO, followed by another quick break. When we come back, we're gonna have a quick fireside chat on pre-IPO board governance. And then to round us out, our last session will cover achieving success as a new public company. Please note the same Zoom link will be used for each session. So without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our first presenter to share the mar IPO market update. Eileen Connors is a director at BMO Capital Markets. Eileen, welcome. Thank you, Colin, and good morning, everybody. It is a total delight to be here, and I love, uh, Colin, paraphrasing your comments on the, the poll, that healthy optimism, that phrase is something that I, I just feel like we, we're hearing quite a bit and it's the right way to describe what's going on in this IPO market. It's not too negative. It's not euphoric. It's finally in a, a place that I do think folks feel feel healthy and you're going to hear that from us today. Um, but, you know, discerning and nuanced and a lot to talk about. Uh, and, and it's a place, frankly, of, of storytelling. Uh, and that's going to kind of guide our discussion today. So, uh, Anna, if you don't mind helping. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so we can dive right in here on page one. So before we get going on the, the meat of things, just wanted to take a minute to explain uh, who we are at BMO, for those that are not as familiar, and then who I am. So BMO is a uh, Canadian bank. It is the, the tenth, or a top 10 North American bank, uh, eighth largest across all of North America, uh, headquartered in Toronto, but with a truly global presence. So I am coming to you in case it's it's not totally evident from what's behind me uh, from Times Square in New York. Uh, and I've been with the firm here in this office in New York for 11 years. Uh, the majority of that time has been running our equity syndicate desk, 
which means that I am uh, focused on the execution on a sector agnostic basis of any of the equity underwriting uh, that we're doing here at BMO in the US. So that includes IPOs, that includes follow-ons, uh, pretty much anything, again, equity US at BMO is coming through my desk. So the perspectives you're gonna hear today are coming from uh, like a, a pretty diverse, a pretty global uh, mix of experiences and, and different company stories. Uh, and you know, with that caveat of experience that you know, we've been doing this uh, for, for quite some time and have uh, a quite rich history. So let's get into the meat of things on page two here. So I think when you're talking about an IPO market update, whether it's uh, speaking with CEOs and CFOs, speaking with investors, everybody's starting with the macro, right? And why is that? It has been tremendously important now in terms of translating to IPO receptivity, uh, certainly for the past two years, but it's really top of mind of every for everyone to have better visibility, to have better conviction in where we're going as a market and, and where we're going as a world, frankly. Uh, so just to sort of set the stage at the most basic level, on the upper left-hand side here, you see a chart that is showing market resilience and market outperformance, frankly. So the fact that NASDAQ is up 30% in the last 12 months, the fact that you have the S&P up over 20% in the last 12 months. Yes, we've seen the past couple of weeks be, be a little bit trickier, and there are certainly um, pretty significant reasons for that, and we'll get into that. Um, but overall, investors have seen a time that has been rewarding um, but that we still think has further to go. This is what we've been able to do without greater uh, clarity around interest rates uh, and when they'll come down. And that kind of leads us to the top right-hand side of the page, uh, thinking about volatility and, and thinking about the rate environment. Interest rate direction, whether that's the, the actual nominal level, the timing of a cut, or uh, the pace of cuts for the future, are top of mind for any investor, certainly anybody that's of a more generalist variety. Uh, it's the starter for every conversation. And we at BMO do still believe that July is the time for the first initial cut, uh, and we'll see two cuts for the year. But things are swirling around quite a bit. As anybody that's, you know, we're all reading the journal every day, we're watching CNBC every day. Uh, these things are changing live, but they do continue to remain top of mind, which makes sense. Right, because when we think about funding costs, uh, when we think about when this market is going to have a watershed event and, and open more generally, rates are a really critical driver of that. And, and again, top of mind. The VIX, uh, thinking about volatility, there, there's a reason that I want to call this out. And, and that's the gray line on the upper right hand side showing right at 19. The reason that that's relevant specifically for what we're going to talk about today is that when equity capital markets professionals think about the new issue environment, and, and certainly for, for IPOs in particular, 20 is usually the thermostat, right? So north of 20, there's a lot of consideration as to how to navigate the market. And uh, there is the occasional decision to pause and hold off until the market is able to calm down. Below 20 is an easy green light. Maybe not always so easy, but by and large, that, that's sort of the, the barometer that we use with ADCM. The events geopolitically over the weekend, plus most recent inflation readings, have seen us uh, tick upward slightly um, and come closer to that 20 level. That's not something that folks are too concerned about right at this moment, but this is changing by the day. And if you were to see that inflect higher and stay higher, that's going to cause uh, you know a greater period of pause and a greater period potentially of concern when it comes to, again, taking IPOs and, and getting them out into the market. But all that said, I, we really like this bottom graph. And, and again, this is this is just visualizing, you know, all of the different pieces that we talk about uh, for, for IPO market receptivity. What we have here is a proprietary barometer that we call, that we uh, have at BMO, that is keeping track of what are the things that are important to IPO investor participants? This is inclusive of macro factors. This is inclusive of other deal performances, right? So are we at a period where IPOs largely work, IPOs are largely breaking, uh, and this is generating a number on a scale from one to 10 to show basically, you know, again, what's your temperature? What's the temperature of the market? So if you look at 
you know, as a comparison through 2022 to the beginning of 2023, we see a lot of red. And for those of us that have been following this, not a surprise, right? You saw significant market uncertainty and, and quite, you know, a tumultuous world picture, but you also saw a lack of supply on the IPO side. So that was considered really when we talk about windows, that's a closed market window. What you have seen in 2024 throughout the first quarter is not only the move, you know, up and to the right on the uh, above, call it above five level of, of receptivity, but it's stayed there. You have seen that come down again, just thinking about the, the volatility of the past couple of weeks, but that tick down is exactly to historical levels. So right now we're just shy of six on a one to 10 scale. And again, this isn't a perfect reading, but hopefully gives some visual perspective of how we think of things. Um, we're in line with the general receptivity over the course of call it the last 10 years. So if we could turn to page three, this is what's happened so far. This is the 2024 IPO report card, if you will. So on the top left, you see we've priced, call it 15 deals for a total of $8 billion in proceeds. And shown across the, the Q1 spectrum from 2018, that's looking a, a little bit lackluster, right? We almost have this uh, sort of perfect bell curve type thing that's about to tick back up. But we all are aware now in hindsight that 2021, the beginning of 2021 was such an unusual time. And what we as banking professionals like to see and what we've enjoyed seeing in Q1 is this, what we're calling it, again, a nuanced return to normalcy. You're seeing a, a, a market that's much closer in complexion to those pre-COVID years uh, and allowing for more discerning by investors and discerning uh, you know, moments by companies to figure out you know, where is the place for me in this market. Opposite uh, on the on the right hand side, the upper right, just want to run through a couple statistics because I think again, if we if we consider a report card, how are we doing? I think we're actually doing pretty well. So as we mentioned, 15 for, for about $8 billion, a significant move up from Q1 of 2023. Average offering size of over $500 million. That's really interesting because if you think back to, to Q1 of, of 2023, this is almost a double from where we were a year ago. So not only are transactions getting done, but transactions of, of significantly greater size are able to price and able to get into the market. That's a great sign for folks because it means that uh, these deals that have mostly worked, which we're going to get to, have been generating returns for investors and for companies that have had you know, complex stories that have needed to raise capital, they have found a home in this market. The other side, secondary proceeds. Anyone that may have listened to our uh, December update a couple months ago would have heard us talk about the balance of primary and secondary proceeds in the, in the IPO market. Are you going out and, and raising new capital for your company or is a financial sponsor monetizing, right? and you know, effectively having like a floating event. What we've seen is a lower number of average uh, secondary proceeds or conversely a greater number of primary proceeds, which is a healthy balance, uh, especially from the investor mindset of, I wanna help a company grow and put money to work and have strong uses of proceeds out in the market uh, that I can capture and, and you know, grow with the company. We're starting to see that balance uh, come back to, to more normal levels. Average of 26% of, of companies being floated in this market related to the uh, raising of primary proceeds, that is a jump higher from what we had seen last year. It was closer to 15%. So not only are you, you know, you're seeing these larger deals, but they also represent on average a greater number of the total company. And then finally, you know, this is really good news for, for everybody on this line today. The vast majority of these transactions have priced either within their marketing ranges or above. So to me, what that means is you're seeing you know, healthy demand for these transactions. You're seeing healthy outcomes for companies. These IPOs are largely not taking people by surprise, right? Where they're, they're pricing in their marketing range where demand is driving it higher. And for the banks, there is appropriate valuation being put into the market where, uh, again, there is a level of uh, accepted, you know, accepted mentality by investors um, that, that this is where these, these deals should price. The lower left-hand side is about performance. And I really can't stress enough how much 
this has been a, a ray of light for the year. So on average, on a one month basis, um, and you can look at performance, you know, a number of different ways across what we've seen so far this year. Uh, but we like the one month and, and the three month looking back historically, because it gives us these, it gives that idea of, did this stick, right? Was this a one day out performance that then came crashing down? Or is this something that has worked over time? And the story so far for this year is that you've seen just that, right? So the average one month performance on these transactions that have come this year is up about 18%. The range is significant. Not all deals are trading up. It's about 75% of total proceeds are trading above issue price, but largely and thematically, you've seen deals grind up. The offer to three month this year, of course, is not gonna be as great of a data point, as helpful as a data point is looking back. But so far, again, you're, you're seeing uh, the, the trend move the right way. And if you look back, especially 2022, 2023, even back to 2021, you actually saw deals falling off after the first quarter. And when we talk to companies about how important it is to manage the expectations of the market when going public and be able to you know, deliver on your first quarter as a public company and, and message to the market accordingly, you know, this reflects the right story here in 2024. This reflects the right story of uh, being able to just continue to appreciate in the market over time and not take the market by surprise where you know you, you see a, a quick hit higher and then move lower. And then finally on this page, on the lower right-hand side, what we really see here is a much healthier mix than we've seen in some time. You have representation from healthcare and technology, which in any typical ECM market is gonna you know, be sort of the, the two giants in the room for equity but you've seen consumer, it, it, FCNRs for us stands for food consumer and retail. That's included in a mix of different stories. Uh, you've seen grocery, you've seen some consumer uh, situations. You've seen quite a significant mix. Real estate, we haven't had a REIT IPO since 2021. And you finally saw that this year. So even in, in spite of the interest rate backdrop, having a deal like that come out, very interesting. And then finally industrial. So again, all to say that there, it, there's no perfect formula but the trends are certainly interesting and largely, again, healthy uh, and allowing this market to, to function quite well. Let's turn to the next page uh, on page four. So this, this looks like a laundry list and in some ways it is, but when we think about um, what management teams, what you all are thinking about, right? Before pursuing an IPO, before going out into this market, the reality is, there are factors that you can control and factors that you absolutely can't control, right? I think broadly on a macro basis, we are in a world that is changing sometimes hourly, right? If not certainly weekly and monthly. And that's out of the control of, of any of the management teams that are looking to get public right now. But what you can control is a lot of what's on this page, right? In terms of how you convey the strength of your story how you're able to incorporate feedback from thought leading investors, from uh, investment banks that can give you know, the right advice as to how can I most appropriately have my story uh, valued and ready to go as a, as a public company. And there are some things that are gonna be consistent over time, that's the left-hand side of the page, you know, the, the always big deal type items. And then the, the left, that's probably the right-hand side of the page, is more of a sliding scale. So we'll take a couple of examples here. On the left-hand side, management expertise is always the top of the list, especially in a market like this. Investors want to hear the company story told from professionals who can talk about the business inside and out, have a long track record, can enable that trust to allow them to put money to work at a time when, let's be honest, there's a lot of options, right, of where to invest. Why should I invest in your story? And that's going to be required to be told by a strong management team. Think about on the on the lower side, uh, barriers to entry. How do you talk about why your company is special and where does it fit in the competitive landscape? That's always going to be important. On the right-hand side, two of the things, if I had to call out, that are really critical to investors right now, if you are looking to price your IPO today, size of discount versus peers, right? And that really is a factor of the market that we are in, meaning 
you know, what does it require? What, how do you use valuation as a lever to interact with investors, right? Are you able to uh, garner the attention and the quality that is necessary to have a strong foundation of a, as a public company with the valuation that you're seeking? And how do you play with that in advance of launching an IPO such that you see the success of you know, launching well, pricing well, and trading well over time? And then leverage, and this is this is just something that is um, increasingly talked about, increasingly important. What is your debt load? How do you plan on managing it? And it makes sense, right? Because if we think back to the interest rate environment uh, and how the cost of debt should be expected to be handled moving forward, uh, this is top of mind for investors not only to have comfort on investing in positions today, but understanding what's the company going to look like in terms of the way they, they manage their debt load in a year's time and beyond. So let's flip to, to page five here. This is really kind of a visualization of what we just talked about. And I think sometimes it's, it's helpful to put this all on a page and understand what is the scope of reality, right? What is the scope of outcomes that's out here? So what we have here uh, on the x-axis is IPO discounts, and that's counted just on a straight discount of a multiple basis. And then on the y-axis is offer to current, or how has your deal performed in the market since going public? And really what you see here is, first of all, a little bit of chaos, right? You have So we have uh, 2023 IPOs in light blue, 2024 in dark blue, and the range of outcomes is significant. Right. So so let's talk about a couple of these on the way upper right. You have Astera Labs. This is a deal that priced a couple of weeks ago. What made that so special? That was an AI story and the enthusiasm around the sector and the quality of the investors that were around this uh, really played into trends in the broader market that people are excited about. This was a way to invest in AI in a new way. Uh, and therefore, you did have a situation where not only did this garner a premium, but it proceeded to trade up, right? And so that is clearly a wonderful outcome, but also clearly the exception across this broader market. On the, uh, if we sort of draw the line backwards and we think about a, a transaction like Brightspring that did come at a discount that has struggled a bit in trading and is sort of finding its way, what happened there? You heard us mention earlier about managing uh, leverage. That's a four and a half times levered company that is going to need to uh, work on managing its debt load over time. That's that's a, a, a piece of feedback that we found investors uh, to be a little allergic to, especially right in the beginning of the year, this, this transaction priced um, pretty early in the quarter. Uh, and you saw this um, sort of, again, lever pulling on discount in order to get that transaction priced. Somebody that lives right in the middle, a deal like Reddit, right? Very well-known name, very well-orchestrated uh, story in this market. Reddit had been in the pipeline, uh, the, the public backlog here for call it two years. This was very expected uh, to come. They did need to give a discount to uh, the social media peers, of, I believe a discount of about 17%. Uh, and that was at a valuation that was a significant move down from where it had been valued on a private company level. But it's a transaction that once again was able to price successfully and was able to trade higher. So it's difficult to mark a full trend line through all of these, but it gives you a sense of you know, just how many stories there are out there, uh, just how much sort of quality control from investors is going on. And it is possible to find a way through, but having that uh, sort of ability to be flexible around valuation is really critical right now. And we'd expect that uh, to continue here in the immediate term. Let's move over to, uh, to page six. So here's a little bit of a map of, of some of those stories and some other highlights on the year. And what I really want to highlight here is some, some similars and some differences. And, and this is uh, almost a somewhat, not random selection of deals, but it's a mix, right? And there are some things I'd point out. So first of all, look at the different mix of business descriptions, right? We have everything from, as we mentioned, REITs to home building, to consumer, to tech. Uh, and, and again, we talked about Reddit. Seeing that diversity is a great sign. 
And it's being reflected actually in, in the other companies that are filing in the public backlog and planning on coming to market. It's showing that it doesn't take just one type of deal to work in this market. We're not seeing 100% biotech market. We're not seeing just a total tech dominance. Uh, we're not seeing you know, exclusively value plays come. You're seeing a, a quite balanced mix of, of industries. I also look at as a result, you know, the different uh, methodol- evaluation methodologies uh, and the focus period, right? Astera Labs was based on 2026 valuation. Now that is quite helpful. That sounds a lot like the COVID market that we were in, but by and large, you see a mix of companies that were valued on sales, companies that were valued on EBITDA. It's, it's a significant mix. And again, just being able to continue to watch that evolve for all of us that are paying attention to this market, it's really good to have data points across you know, different types of companies and different types of valuation situations to say, okay, you know, if it worked for them, perhaps it could work for another situation. And then one similar across this group, you heard me talk earlier about performance. I, it sounds like a broken record, but it really can't be stated enough. If I look at that offer to current uh, row on the second to last uh, part of the column or part of the table here, excuse me, each of these days is, deals is trading up. They're trading up in different magnitudes, but the fact that you have this relative consistency of performance is nothing but good for this market. Uh, turning to page seven, we have a bit of a spotlight here. And, and in case you couldn't guess it, it's about the election. And uh, this is a question that's coming up in a lot of meetings. And I think we have a pretty good answer for it in terms of how do you think about IPO issuance and the presidential election? And so what we did here is put some numbers behind this because, you know, this is certainly, well, while the election that's coming up is expected to be um, certainly unlike many others that we have seen in, in recent history, uh, this is an event that can be modeled out, right, to the best of our abilities. And it's going to be a complex calendar over the course of the, re- the year, uh, certainly in the U.S., but the good news of what you're seeing on this page is this impact of an ele- a presidential election on IPO issuance is both temporary and it is possible to navigate. Right. So if you look right in the middle of the page, the median number of IPOs uh, that are being priced between September and November. So largely think, you know, election, the the heat of election season, it is lower than non-election years, but it's not drastically lower. And I think as we as we sort of consider those weeks of eligible issuance in a typical IPO calendar, most of them remain preserved. We would not advise a company to look to launch or price an IPO right concurrent with election day, but most of September is largely on the table. uh, And importantly, on the other side, December's have proven quite fruitful. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, The other thing, again, non-election years, the September, September, October, November class represents a a lower number versus the election years, i.e., Uh, Some of these just have been fewer deals overall on the year, on the election year. But again, you're not seeing a dramatic impact. You're really, really able to navigate this. uh, And it really is just that season that we see as being, again, temporarily impacted. Uh, Turning to to page eight, my favorite takeaway probably of this study is take a look at December. December consistently, whether it was 2012 2016, 2020, you have seen the market open back up. So I think about, you know, again, and and bankers talk about windows and what does that mean? The last window of the year is typically right after Thanksgiving to a couple of weeks before the holidays. And for a lot of us, it's the busiest time of the year. It oftentimes is. In election years, you don't see a difference, which to us means in the most recent past, you haven't seen really Uh, a a drop off depending on the results of the election. It is more a clearing point that the election has concluded and we now have visibility into what the administration will look like in the future. So finally, and I'm I'm conscious of time here, page nine, we have what's ahead, right? And again, for those that that may have listened to us in December, um, I think this is sort of a manifestation of a lot of 
the the optimism and the constructive attitudes that we had uh, been thinking about at the at the end of 2023. So there are some great things to think about. There's some cautious things to think about, and there's some lessons learned from last year. So left side of the page, what are we really excited about? Investor appetite for new and new issues. I think we've we've kind of proven that out uh, through a lot of different data points. But the appetite is there, and the and the examples of successful deals are there. Macro visibility, regardless of where we're going with interest rates, the visibility point is closer than it's ever been. And that will eventually prove a point of relief for investors. And finally, investor firepower, whether it's private equity firms, your financial sponsors, or institutional investors uh, trading regular way, the amount of capital that investors are looking to put to work is very significant right now. And that is nothing but beneficial, right, for the companies that are looking uh, to take those proceeds and, and put them to good, good work. On the caution side, geopolitical risk, I think this speaks for itself. Uh, but needless to say, this is a world that's navigating a lot of quite tricky situations uh, and understanding the need to be flexible in real time as these develop is going to be critical for management teams. Market concentration. How much of the, the performance that we are seeing, the relative outperformance, is being driven by a small amount of companies? Translated to investors, you know, how do you discern, and management teams, how do you discern your story versus the overall trends? Uh, and, and how do you differentiate yourself there? And then finally, the calendar, right? Whether it's rates, whether it's the election season, it's already April. We know how quickly the summer can go. Uh, and how hyped the, the fall calendar could be around an election, regardless of whether or not it impacts the number of IPOs that price, uh, there's a lot of distractions, right? And so trying to perfectly time your transaction or perfectly time your uh, investor engagement, it, it's almost impossible to do. And navigating that, uh, again, is it, just something to be mindful of. Finally, on the bottom here, uh, I think about the lessons that we learned last year and, and how do we put those into play. The two I'm going to highlight, and, and you know, we can uh, you know, hopefully give some good food for thought on the day. Number, if I look at number two here, management execution out of the gate and why that matters. Seeing strong performance from the, the companies that have recently come public and are now public reporting companies allows for really a rising tides lifts all boats situation, right? So when we think about the rest of your day today and, and how you think about the boot camp, what you'll hear, I'm sure, from, from the many folks that are giving some advice here is it's not just about the IPO event. It's how are you managing yourself beyond that, right? And, and how can you look to others that, and, and see the examples that are out there and have that translate into best practices? And then finally, uh, the last one here, valuation and pricing discount. Being able to stay agile, being able to be informed now, right, and be prepared now as to the permutation of outcomes uh, and structure your story accordingly in an ability to uh, or at, in reaching the goal of being public is so critical. And frankly, uh, and I'll leave it here, it's why days like this are such a good use of time, right, because it allows for uh, the sharing of, of best practices, sharing of market intelligence and really the, the ability to plan ahead as best we can in a market where frankly, you know, planning can, can be a fool's errand, uh, but this is, is just such a good use of time. So I'll leave it there, uh, Colin and team, thanks so much uh, for, for having us as always. Thank you, Eileen, for that market update. Really appreciate it. Up next, we've got our panel of experts who will cover preparing for and staying on track from your IPO. So please join me in welcoming our moderator for the discussion, Nicola Corzine, who's the CEO and Executive Director here at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. We've got Francois Tra Chadwick, who's a partner at KPMG, Gordon Graft, who's a partner at Wilson Sonsini, and Dan Angus, Managing Director at NASDAQ. Nicola, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Colin. Um, it is great to be here today, attempting to share those best practices that Eileen referenced under a ray of light, which is always a nice way to start the conversation without doubt. Um, today, we are going to attempt to address some of those key issues that are probably front and center on so many of your minds today as you aim to try to figure out, is this path right for me? What are some of the considerations that I really need to be thinking about now 
and in this market and moment? And how can I accelerate my success through the advisors that we've gathered here today, all of whom are tremendous experts in their field? So again, to our panel, welcome. I'm going to invite each of you to share a little bit about your background as we answer some of these questions today. So your first question, perhaps we can start by including a little bit about some of those amazing experiences that bring you to our stage today. So Dan, let's start with you. Welcome. Um, you know, for so many founders joining and C-suite and investors, there is a lot to consider about whether or not companies should decide to go public in the first place through an IPO. Um, so what are some of those tips and tricks that you think of around considering whether or not that pathway is right for those? Thank you, Nicola. I really appreciate it. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Angus, Managing Director at NASDAQ. I've uh, worked here for uh, over 10 years in this role, helping bring hundreds of companies uh, to our wonderful exchange and also seeing the pre and post work that goes into the process. And, um, you know, Nicola, you, you bring up a really good back of the envelope way to think about an IPO. And um, Generally, what I advise companies, and, and just by way of background, we we typically engage with private growth stage companies two to three years prior to them entering the public markets. And so a lot of these discussions do arise. When do we go? How do we go? What are the KPIs and benchmarks that would determine if we should go? Now, there's a very academic method of looking at this, you know, very much financially, you know, KPI driven and so forth. But that takes a lot of time and effort and really just getting a, a initial litmus test and emotional read on whether your board or your management team or the operations in general are ready to go public. I mean, there are certain things to pay attention to. Um, one is the current state of your controls and forecasting. So, you know, do you have an ERP system set up? Have you done audits? Have you stepped beyond that into developing relationships with banks, not necessarily choosing them? Um, have you also surveyed the landscape of other advisors, such as technical accounting firms, investor relations firms, so forth? You know, Where are you in those either implementation steps as it relates to ERP and forecasting, all the way to developing relationships? I only say that not so much as a determinant as to you know that being the no or go type signal, but it's really informative of the sense of how much work you're going to need to put into the process. And so by and large, what we found, and I'd love my you know panelists viewpoint on this, from soup to nuts in IPO prep minus audit and ERP implementation, um, we'll take about nine to 12 months. Um, you know, I'd definitely extend that further beyond for those more chunky projects. <laughs> And so, um, you know, where where are you in that process also leads to the inevitable question of staffing. Who do you have with you right now that can help start that process? And, you know, do you need to staff up and how long will that take? Um, I, I will say that there has been hesitation from the market as to going in driving an IPO without a full-time CFO. Um, some companies have tried to do that. And for some points, it has worked out. But moving forward, I think everyone would agree that you want that. Also, um, you know, other individuals that are typically helpful in this process that would be great to get on the front end because it's hard to find them on the back end after it um, is, you know, someone that focuses on um, FP&A as well as, uh, you know, SEC reporting. And so that the SEC reporting element, just to keep that in mind, is a little bit of an arcane practice that uh, it, it's that skill set is, is challenging to find. And so that's another element. The other component is um, how your executive team is going to interact with all of the different audiences that they have to speak with. They are likely very well adept at speaking to venture capitalists from you know various uh, stretches and geographies. But how are they, uh, how much confidence do you have in their ability to engage with institutional investors that have a different, you know, viewpoint as to investment horizons, returns, and ex expectations? How are you confident in their ability to speak with the sell-side analysts? Um, further, how are they doing when it comes to managing relationships with the board? Because while they will maintain 
a number of board members that have been in the previous, you know, pre-IPO iteration, they're going to bring in new independents. And so it begs the question of, can they transfer, can they maintain existing relationships, still, you know, objectively deliver on results, but then also have bandwidth enough to develop the new relationships necessary on the board level to help make this an efficient process. And so, again, just to bullet point this out, where are you in terms of your infrastructure? You know, have you set that up? Secondly, what relationships have you developed with the key audiences? And thirdly, the deep and honest objective look into how your executive team will interact with the critical parties that will be a part of the IPO process. Hopefully that that helps to start us off, Nicola. I love it. Now, that's such thoughtful guidance. And I think it really does manage the expectations of how you prepare for this journey. And it is an ongoing journey. And maybe with that note, Francois, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. It's, it's a point, not a destination per se. You know, for so many founders, the motivation for why is obviously infused deeply with a need to access the right levels of capital. But in this market and in this moment, there are many other considerations as you think about alternative funding options. How do you guide, and please again, share a little bit about your amazing background that brings you here, but how do you guide founders and C-suite and investors to really think through the advantages and disadvantages of weighing up some of those alternative modes against an IPO strategy? Yeah, and thank you, Nicola. I'm going to build a little bit on what Dan was mentioning as well, but for the audience, Francois Chadwick, I'm a partner at KPMG. I'm based in the San Francisco office. I am the global and national lead of what we call the emerging giants practice. So think of pre-IPO, VC-backed, PE-backed companies that are looking to have some sort of exit in the next three to five year window. Uh, prior to me rejoining KPMG, I was a CFO. I spent a lot of time at Uber. I was the acting CFO there, helped scale the company, uh, took it public, and I was CFO of another couple of other companies and took them public as well. So I've been able to see on both sides of the fence and had been the advisor and also had some of the headaches and challenges that Dan was talking about at the front end that need to be considered. And if I put myself back in the shoes of the time when I was the CFO of these companies, thinking about fundraising, fundamentally, uh, if you're thinking of going through an IPO process, you've got to think about a lot of what Dan mentioned, right? Once, if you're going to go through that process, there are an, a large number of steps that need to be thought about. You have to step through and then once you're public on one of your other panels, uh, in your next two panels, you're going to talk about getting ready to be public and then what it's like to be post-public. You have to listen to all of those stories if you wish to go through the IPO process. And some companies, what they'll do is they'll do a dual track where they'll start on down the path of thinking they want to go through an, an IPO. But at the same time, they may be getting themselves set up to be ready to be, put, to be purchased, to be bought through some sort of M&A activity. So that's something that companies think about as they may be doing this both IPO, M&A track, cold dual tracking. Um, but at the same time, you need to look at where you are in your growth plans. And maybe you're just not quite that, at that point in time right now where you're ready to go IPO or you're not ready to be bought because there's future value that can be developed within the company. And so that's when you've got to start to think about maybe we need additional funding right now from VCs or from a PE fund there's a difference there, you know, with a VC, they're going to give you money and they're going to be less involved. The PE will give you private equity, will give you money, but will probably want to be more involved in how they run the business. you got to think of those considerations. But either way, if you're going to raise money, the one thing I always say to folks and the one question that I always used to always got asked was, well, what are you going to spend it on? And if you, you've got to have a solid answer to that, because if you don't have the answer to that, or you can't explain the, the value that's going to be created from that investment, then you got to rethink your thesis. So a number of different steps, a number of different thought processes, you're thinking about how to raise money and where to get it from. Mm -hmm. And rethinking a thesis, if need be, is, is it's definitely better to do it then than after yeah. the fact. Um, and, and I think equally what's inspiring by what you shared, Francois, is 
is how much of this is also on the mindset, right? So alliance of an executive team to think about what is the right capital that is suited, yes, for our stage, but equally for our goals and our priorities around how we want to be in partnership with this capital, not in partnership mm -hmm. against the capital. Because yeah. again, I think that's, that's where frictions and markets pick up on those frictions and challenges can occur. So thank you for that. Gordon, welcome. Lovely to have you. Um, I, again, I will invite you to share a little bit about your background as you answer this question. Um, I wish it was as simple as saying there's a singular stage, you just kind of enter and it all happens and voila, we have a, a, a wonderful bell moment on NASDAQ and the stars and the confetti are many. Um, obviously, it's not quite that simple. There are many stages that go into uh, an IPO. Can you walk us through a little bit maybe of those uh, block and tackle moments that are present on the table as a founder and, and C-suite and investors get ready to enter this very big moment in time? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, um, for the group, I'm Gordon Graft. I'm a partner at Wilson Sonsini. I'm out of the San Francisco office. I'm a technology lawyer. I work with pre-IPO companies, taking them public and working with them on the, the public company side on the other side of the transaction. So this is something that I spend a lot of time thinking about, a lot of time preparing companies for, for this process. Um, and as Dan alluded to, th this process, uh, it, it doesn't even start when you say we're doing an IPO, this is the IPO process, this starts years before with some of the preparation work that companies will be doing. And that can be building out the right board, building out the right management team, building out some of the financial resources um, that, that we've already mentioned here. It can be things like corporate cleanup on the legal side. Um, but in terms of the IPO itself, um, once you really get going, often the key first moment is the organizational meeting. And that'll be when you get the full working group together, the bankers, lawyers, auditors, key folks from the company, and you get everyone aligned on the same page of, hey, this is the company, this is what we're doing. Let's all get excited and, and start working towards this crazy milestone that we're all going to push really hard towards over the next many, many months. Um, and, and from that point, you start working on uh, the registration statement, which will be your key disclosure document and the basis for all of the marketing materials that you'll use on the roadshow. Uh, and that document is a really hefty one, but it contains a lot of great stuff. It'll be where you tell the story of the business. It'll be where management speaks to the financial results and tells the financial story of the company. It'll be when the lawyers like me add in the, the risk factors to try and save you when you're getting sued on the other side. Uh, and, and that will be a long, arduous process uh, to get that document into shape. Uh, and that kind of is part one of the process. And at the end of that, you'll submit it confidentially to the SEC. You'll go back and forth with the SEC on a number of comments to refine the registration statement, um, probably add in some updated financials along the way. Uh, and when you get the, the draft registration statement into tip top shape and you're ready to go, you'll flip it public and, and then get out on the road. And that's when selling the stock really becomes the key part. And that's when the bankers earn their money because you're out there and the management team and the bankers are on the road meeting with investors, telling the story, talking about the company, taking all that work that you put into the words on the page and translating that into you know live conversations with folks, getting people excited about the stock. Um, at the end of that roadshow process, you'll price the transaction, uh, have that very exciting bell ringing moment, uh, stock will start trading. And then, you know, the, the piece that I always laugh about is it, it's not until a couple of days after the stock's already been trading and people have kind of forgotten about it that you actually close the transaction officially. <laughs> but but that does happen as well. And so all of that, as we talked about, th this spans many months, many quarters um, and takes a lot of work. But at a very, very high level, those are some of the key stages. Fantastic. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you. And. You know, you. I think each and every one of you have alluded to the importance of benchmarks and milestones really being present throughout the duration of this entire process, and it's a lengthy one. Francois, I'd, I'd love to come back to you for a moment, maybe, and, and we can double click on that. It, can you walk through some of the examples that you've seen of what those benchmarks and milestones actually look like? What 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 is what is needed when you think about key indicators that this company is really ready and primed to have this wonderful IPO milestone? ahead of them yeah and and it, it's a fascinating question because this evolves and changes over time so if you go back to where i was 10 years ago um you know the mantra was growth at all costs and if you could show growth and hockey stick you know x number of users and things like that then the market put value on that and that was something that was um, a key driver back then a key metric 
obviously the whole financial macro market has now changed so growth is still something everybody's looking for that you, you if you don't have a growth story it's going to be very difficult to think about going on a public market however there's now this added one of the path to profitability and so this is where we've seen some of the uh, stories recently over the last couple of years where you know companies have been cost cutting whilst they show that trend towards that path to profitability now one thing i would also say nicola is that there are some industries where the key metric may not be revenue and it may not be growth think of life sciences right in a life science type company if you get an approval for a particular process or a, a drug or something like that, that approval will be the milestone that will then allow that company to potentially go on a public market. So there's a little bit of like looking at the particular sector, which will drive those metrics. But I will say for the most part, from a financial standpoint, what the, what the bankers are looking for is things such as, you know, growth, gross margin, path to profitability. And that's part of the story. Uh, Gordon was mentioning the story that you got to talk about once you go on the road. Those are things that everyone starts to ask about. So think about those metrics as you're going down that journey. Yeah, absolutely. And as you're pre-planning them, make sure that you see them in line of sight as to how you're going to execute on them, because obviously yeah. that's unfolding through the process. Uh, thank you, Francois. Um, Gordon, you, know, you actually, a few people have already mentioned about this realistic viewpoint that um, things change, uh, uh, the wonderful things change in the process of, of not only getting ready to go through the IPO, but then the IPO itself, including things like board, uh, the composition of the board, the advisors that you have around you, even the governance affecting the company. How do you help uh, management teams both think about that and prepare for that. Obviously, for many of our founders joining uh, and the mission of the center is to accelerate those who have not necessarily had that background in the past. So can you help um, transparently address some of those issues relating to ownership and governance and perhaps some of the board nuances as companies go through this very large milestone? Yeah, absolutely. I think when I think about governance and, and getting ready to be a public company, I always like to think that there's kind of two elements to it. And, and one of it is building out great governance and building out a great company. There's elements of that that will be helpful to you whether or not you ultimately consummate an IPO. There's things like building out a great board, making sure you've got the right advisors around you, thinking about things like, you know, maybe it's data privacy practices or ESG practices or whatever might be important to your company and your industry. Um, building out those things ahead of time, that's only going to add value to the company. Then there's elements that, you know, really are tied to being a public company, going through the IPO process and, and having to have the right governance structure for the other side of that. And that type of stuff, I often say, can wait until you get a little bit closer to actually going through with a transaction. And, and at that point, you're starting to think about, OK, what what is the SEC going to require of me? What are the stock exchanges going to require of me? Do I have the right board composition? Do I have the right independent committees? Um, am I adopting the right policies for governance, things like insider trading or related party transactions or code of conduct? Um, and that all tends to be a barrage of paperwork that comes during the IPO process when you don't already have enough other stuff going on. <laughs> Oh, say so it's not so a barrage of paperwork. Uh, no, we fully fully understand and appreciate why that's obviously needed. Um, and and thank you for those insights. And like you, you know, we would advocate that governance is equally a journey that founders take from from day one, hopefully. And then when it's part of your DNA, it's just organic to continue in that process, and and not a hard or a big leap as you go through these very important and 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 larger growth transitions. You know, speaking of larger growth and transitions, Dan, you were so kind as to really talk through the importance of the investment that everyone at NASDAQ takes on your team and beyond to really support these management teams well before the IPO moment has has ever been talked about and 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 heard of as like a, a date set in stone. Um, what do you think or what is some of the guidance that you offer to these management teams as they think about whether or not you know the primary factors are ready and in place for them to be able to take advantage of a market or to, or to be confident in saying, yes, now is the time for us to really move forward towards this transaction? Definitely. Um, 
One element that uh, drawing from Francois's comments uh, about KPIs and financials is I think a good starting point is it, a lot of companies typically ask, hey, at what point do I start talking to bankers, investors, sales side analysts, you know, from, from a financial viewpoint. And currently right now, if you're a software SaaS company, you know, you're looking at around the the range is 200 to 400 in um, annual recurring revenue. This has been inching upwards to probably be more solidly at 300. And it seems like it's going north of that. I don't believe that this is going to be the uh, benchmark on for a long for the long term. And the reason why is that I think as we as the pendulum shifts between the market wanting profitability versus growth and vice versa, you know, there, there's a thought that if there was more of an emphasis on growth, perhaps that revenue rate or revenue amount would need to be or can be and should be less. And so that number will change. But if you're in that ballpark, it's generally a good time to start talking to um, in, in, in not in not in any particular order, but you know, banks, but with an emphasis on sell side analysts. So just for background sake, there is a lot of regulation and red tape surrounding how a private company, their investment bank, and then the sell side analyst component can interact with each other. And, and also there's a lot of, you know, hair around what banks can say they will do. Uh, once a company is public from, uh, you know, an analyst coverage model. Um, for example, they can't go out and blanketly promise all of their companies uh, that they'll get their tier 1A analyst, senior analyst that's been there for 30 years to cover them in perpetuity. That, that's just not possible. Um, but what you can do in part of that dialogue is, you know, say, you know, as a condition of us working with you, we would like this type of coverage with these individuals. Can you please agree to that? And you ideally want to get there, but that takes a lot of time and engagement in order to get to that point where you can actually make that request. And so I would say that the investment of your time should, you know, certainly be with banks to a certain degree, but more focused on sell side relationships as they will drive investor behavior following the IPO in part. The other component is um, institutional investors. And so pre-COVID, you know, I think that a number of companies could get out and launch a successful IPO with 30 to maybe 50 meetings with institutional investors. And so that's well and good, but post COVID, especially now, that number has gone up to around, on average, a company needs to touch 80 investors, not meetings, investors. And so the reason is, is because, uh, you know, these portfolio managers are spending the majority of their time um, managing their current portfolios to manage risk, as opposed to finding new you know, investment opportunities um, in the IPO market. Um, when they do find something that interests them, the level of diligence that they're going to express is magnitudes higher than it was certainly versus 2021, but even before then. And you need to be in a position where it starts like all things in building a relationship in a very colloquial way. Go to conferences, meet and be thoughtful about the investors, PMs that you want to talk to at the respective banks or conferences. Start having those one-off meetings when you happen to be in New York or Zoom meetings and be consistent. You know, the last thing that you'd like to do is to rely upon your bank about, you know, three weeks before, you know, a non-deal roadshow and expect them to fill the slate and just assume that it's going to be this warm and fuzzy type of engagement. It will undoubtedly not be. And so starting that process now is generally better. Um, the other element that I would say in terms of investment of your time is I, I can't express this enough. And Francois has been on a couple panels with me. I have said this ad nauseum 
media training is incredibly important for executives, especially when you think about certain sectors like SaaS CEOs and founders, they're generally, you know, magnetic and, and conversational, but sometimes, you know, your, your semiconductor CEO or your biotech CEO who are very technical in nature have difficulty interacting, you know, in that compelling magnetic way. Um, they can certainly get there, but why is this important? Well, you know, definitely building a relationship involves, you know, the investment of time, certainly, but it also involves a level of salesmanship, unfortunately, that you just can't get around because you are competing for oxygen in the room relative to other names, not just potential IPOs, but those other publicly traded companies that are trading at significant discounts right now, because these portfolio managers are looking at return expectations not just the story and narrative of a company. So your your team, and this should go for any of the C-suite that might touch you know, an investor engagement, and that is CEO, CFO, CRO, and possibly a chief product officer, maybe some other you know, subs beneath them. Media training and compelling kind of devil's advocate type training where you push them on how to respond during earnings calls and how to respond during tough questioning during investor meetings. If you can start on that sooner than later and hire a good firm for that, it'll pay for itself by multiples. Um, other than that, you know, there are some things at the margin, but if you are about nine months out, I, I think I, I'd even argue like 12 months out, I, I would say that those would be the three primary focus areas. Ugh, what a fantastic blueprint, Dan. Thank you for that. And and I think so helpful for everyone considering, okay, where should I be putting the investment of my time as we really prep for this? And, and where does it make sense and what really matters? Uh, just a quick follow-up question. I know last year when I had the honor of, of being in a similar conversation, so much of the meetings were still happening in a digital first environment. Are you still seeing that for the initial meetings, it is that way. I was. It was great to hear you mention conferences and connections yeah. that way. Is it, is it more of a blend these days of prep for both the in person and the online experiences? Yeah, yeah. It's, it, that's a great question. It's a sliding scale. Um, I, I, I'd say that those that have the most success engaging investors or the sell side start with in person meetings and not even a consideration towards virtual. And then over time, as they develop that relationship and the cadence of discussion goes into, hey check back with me in you know, a quarter, let me know about these particular KPIs. If you're on track, that's great for us. That means that you're just doing relationship maintenance. And it's that, that in-person meeting, although if you can swing it, I definitely recommend that. It's not mandatory. I think the way that you want to get to is having met with them in person and virtually frequently enough where when you finally get to that uh, roadshow, you're effectively calling to to basically the goal is a 15 minute check-in to get the order. You know, they have learned so much about you at that point. They have been with you and had broken bread with you that they have a measure of your character as well, that all of the foundation has already been put in place. So those can certainly be virtual if you're at that point. In the event that you are starting at zero, you know, always in person because you're doing something that frankly your peers are not. Um, mm. So that's that's the way I would put it. Mm. Very, very sage advice. Thank you. Um, okay, so Francois, we've already talked some numbers, the the very helpful insights of 200 to 400 million on average, mm -hmm. as far as where we need to be on a revenue north now of 300 seems to be the uh, preferential state. But for so many um, of the management team, they're obviously thinking it probably doesn't just live and die by that singular number alone. Given the immense experience you've had on both sides of the house, what are some of the other financial metrics that management teams really need to be focused around, around that profitability lens or around some of these margin issues and other uh, financial marks that matter? I think it's going to come back to, and, and the, the the number that Dan mentioned there was more on the SaaS space. The, the, that's, that's that. So I think it does come back to sector specific uh, information. Um, but one of the things I would say is like from a, just from a, an overall financial due diligence perspective, right? Making sure that you've got your numbers, whatever numbers you believe are the key metrics, either for your business or as you look at your competitive peer, peer group, 
you've got those numbers locked and loaded. You can track those numbers. Those numbers can be verified. Those numbers can be, you know, if they're challenged, they can be backed up. Gordon mentioned, you know, as they're going through the process, you know, you're going to file some documentation with the SEC. The SEC are becoming much, much more diligent on numbers that sit in the financials, but also sit in the sort of the the front end and the back end of that documentation. As you're talking about your business, as you're talking about the number of users you may have, as you're talking about certain milestones and dates, the SEC are now scrutinizing all of that. So what I recommend to people is make sure you start early to capture the data that you think is relevant for your business and make sure you can back it up time after time after time. And what you want to avoid as a business, because the SEC and others don't like this, is switching those key metrics. Mm -hmm. So if you suddenly in like your first year of business, you're like, oh, this is my key metric. And guess what? It's a really good key metric. And then you go to your second year and it's not that great. So you suddenly change and make another key metric. And then you do the thing in the third year. That's a whole no-no. The SEC will look and ask for that because they can, they can and will ask for what have you been measuring in the prior years. So stick to what is your key metric for your business as it relates to your business and, like I say, your peer group, and then focus on making sure that that metric just improves and, and don't keep swapping, don't keep changing. It, it won't fly with the SEC. Mm -hmm. No bait and switches and, and have the compelling story to back it up. That's, that's yeah. really inspirational. Um, okay. So we could talk at length. I know about this next question relating to regulatory environments, uh, and all that is obviously there for all the right reasons, but intimidating to say the least, probably for most first time uh, management teams as they even try to wrap their arms around how and what and who is involved in all of this that is. Um, for each of you, as you think about sort of the journeys that you take in supporting and advising management teams and successful transactions, what elements do you encourage people to pay attention to from a regulatory standpoint? Uh, maybe Gordon, I'll start with you and then and then Dan and, and Francois uh, invite you each to add. Yeah, from the legal side, the SEC is um, certainly the key regulatory body that we deal with. Um, they're the ones who's reading this registration statement, tooth and comb, and picking out all those fine points that Francois mentioned. Um, it, and I think SEC reporting historically has been something that's been on people's minds as they go public, but what that means has been evolving over the last few years because there's been rule changes and new areas of focus. And ESG is one example right now where there's pending legal challenges, but uh, that, that could be a really big new area of focus. And so thinking about the SEC from our perspective, it's thinking about, you know, how do you engage with them during the IPO process, but then thinking about what, what you're going to see on the other side as a public company as well. And I know we'll probably hit on that in some of the other panels later today, but as people enter this process, being mindful of what's on the other side is, is very important. Back to the continuum that is. Yeah. Dan, what about you? I, I tend to uh, focus on the uh, small stuff because I've heard um, a litany of, I guess you could say nightmare stories where uh, CEOs or founders when engaging with the SEC, you know, there's a certain a director and seniority level that they gravitate to towards, right? And like, you know, whoever happens to be the most senior representative in the room at the time or somehow tangentially associated with it. But what they don't seem to consider is that the analyst is by far the most important engine that they need to cater to. And this goes beyond actually providing the documentation that you need in order to get uh, a registration statement approved. It's also to just get them, you know, comfortable personality wise, not making demands of them as though they're your employee, not acting flabbergasted when there's, you know, you expected 12 comments on a turn and you got 50. Um, and then, you know, seemingly being patient and showing grace when there's an element of them asking things that seem very rudimentary in your view. Um, th the fact of the matter is just taking, you know, jumping in the time machine, Back in 2020 and 2021, especially 21, when everything really blew up in terms of uh, IPO activity, the SEC was absolutely 
um, hamstrung and they were having a ton of capacity issues. Those have abated to a degree, but there's a lot of vestiges because whereas private sector generally recuperates more adaptable, you know, public sector generally is a little bit slower. And so they're still dealing with some of the vestiges of that. And it, it's, it's, it's challenging for them. And so what does that mean in terms of application? Like, look, you don't want to put the cart before the horse and send your registration statement in a year before you plan to go public. You know, that's not, you know, prudent, but maybe budgeting a little bit more time, right? In order for you to get comfortable with the analyst, for you to get comfortable with their request. And so we, you, you don't feel like there's a forcing function for you to force them to give you a decision within your time frame. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would always argue a three to four month buffer for any type of interaction with regulators is important. And I also can't stress enough how smart Francois is. Don't make up or change KPIs. Just don't do it. Like it, it's even though you might have the most academic and beautifully worded, you know, theory or proof as to why this particular KPI that no one has ever heard of really is the one that matters the most. The SEC inherently just looks at those things incredibly it, it, from a very skeptical viewpoint mm -hmm. because they're just their default positioning is how are you trying to pull the wool over the eyes of the average investor? That's ultimately what they're trying to solve for. And that KPI element is, is certainly, if, you, if not presented the right way, it could definitely give them that impression. And also, lastly, I will say that they're I mean, I want to be very transparent with this group. Um, personally, I have, I still think SPACs are a fantastic way to get to market. There were actually a, a surprisingly large, I think we had like 25 or 30 DSPAC combinations in Q1 on NASDAQ alone. Like it's still a viable opportunity. But let me just tell you the reality of if you're trying to go public via SPAC in this climate in the, um, in the SEC regime currently. You are going to have you know, a length of time that's two times as long as you think it is. They are going to have, on average, two to three times more comments about your filing. You can literally get approved and go effective, but yet not be cleared to trade. That is a, like, you know, Gordon could touch on this, I'm sure, but like that has happened to a number of our DSPAC combinations because the company, because the SEC just has an element of discomfort around. SPACs. And so I just want everyone to keep that in mind that if you're looking to go down that road, you have to be aware that this will take more of an effort and longer time investment in engaging with regulators than if you were doing a traditional IPO. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. and, and Nicola, Nicola, a couple of other regulatory bodies, go ahead and mention the SEC. Um, Obviously, in order to file to become a public company, you need audited financial statements. So you need to have an audit firm like KPMG. But there is a body known as the PCAOB. The PCAOB is the auditor of the audit firms. So as you're going through the audit to get those numbers into the financial statements, your audit firm is also thinking about, well, what's this going to look like when I get audited by the PCAOB? So there's that body of regulators that... Is sort of in the background. They're there. They, it influences and, and and drives how an audit firm undertakes their audit. And then I'm sure that Gordon could touch on this as well. But there are state rules as well around sort of diversity on the board composition as well as you're starting to think about that. So th there's other regulations out there that you got to think about as you're going down that path. Such a key insight. And again, one that says, don't do it alone. <laughs> if, if, if We're, we're going to get to key takeaways in a few minutes. My key takeaway for all of you, if you haven't already figured it out, please make sure you have trusted advisors around you who are going to help support you and really anchor you into sharing the intelligence that they've gleaned over decades, and not just individually, but collectively as an expert in their field, as a thought leader in the field, and, and none better than those uh, garnered today. So thank you again for all these insights and best practices shared. We've got about five minutes. Uh, I'm going to 
run through a couple more questions. Uh, but for all of you joining, I'd love you to start uh, thinking about putting in questions into Q and A, and we'll try to get to as many of those as, as we can. But I'm gonna I'm gonna keep chatting for a couple more minutes with this amazing team. Um, Francois, staying with you for a minute, we talked a little bit about due diligence. Uh, we're also big advocates at the center, as I know you are, of like don't leave it till those three weeks before you get ready. Try to get a jump start on it if you can, so that it doesn't feel like the all consuming environment uh, in, in as much as one can control that. How should um, management teams be thinking about due diligence? What can they get a jump start on? Um, what are some of those proactive steps that they can take to be prepared for success? Yeah, I think the due diligence exercise is critical. And, you know, one of the things is start as soon as you possibly can to gather as much information as you possibly can. Um, Gordon mentioned this, you know, uh, the, the filing that you make with the SEC and essentially eventually with the public is your full disclosure. Dan mentioned this as well. It's like, and so you, what you cannot do is file something hoping that, you know, you, you may know there's maybe some sort of like, legal liability or trademark liability, you know, some sort of legal issue or some other issue, you know, it could be something that's happening with the Department of Justice or you, you name it. And it could be in the US, it could be overseas. You can't hide those things, right? Mm -hmm. Because that is a straight path to a shareholder lawsuit post going public, right? So what you need to do is do all of that due diligence. And, you know, if you're a global company in multiple different countries, this is going to take time to really assess where you may have some of these issues, because you've got to consider once you've determined what those issues are, do they impact your financial statement? Do you need to put a reserve in the financial statement for a potential liability that may occur in the future? So you've got to think that. You've also got to think about, do you disclose that? and how you disclose that. And that's why Gordon and his team go become super important as you're thinking about what it is you disclose. Because there is a natural tension in some places where you say, well, if I disclose this, does that give another company some competitive edge, right? And there's always, that discussion happens all the time as you're going through thinking about becoming a public company. But unless you've gathered it all to be able to do that due diligence and you've gathered it early, you are more likely than not to miss it and then go down a path you don't want to go down. Yeah, very, just, very did, yeah if I could go. jump in and build on that, yeah. obviously from the legal perspective, due diligence is critical as well. I, I think this is one of the areas where you can really lean on your team and your advisors and, and start to think ahead even before you start going down the formal path to think about, all right, what are the key areas of our business uh, whether it's regulators or banks or others are going to be curious about and, and how do I think about the questions that are going to be asked and how do I say okay I've got this answer for it or this is something I haven't thought about yet and, and we need to put some resources into building out a, a good um, response there but that's one of the places that I think great companies will be really proactive in thinking about what might come down the pike on that front. Mm, here's to being the right companies I love that Gordon thank you. All right, Dan, I'm going to I'm going to bring the elephant in the room to you uh, on that favorite topic du jour, valuation. Everyone uh, thinking back to Eileen's uh, wonderful chart wants to be the exception in the upper right quad. Uh, how do you guide our management teams, our founders to think through this thorny, thorny topic of managing expectations around valuation uh, and, uh, and 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 start that that tricky and, and difficult conversation in many regards? Yeah. So number one, this is where board relationships are key um, because there might be an instance where a number of growth stage companies right now are contemplating going public, but they have to go public at the same valuation of their last round preferred or potentially less than that. And so this is where the relationships you have with your board and investors are key uh, because you might need to deliver um, bad news to them from this standpoint, because frankly, there's needs for liquidity. There are capital needs, you know, and, and so this just might be a forcing function and you might just be in that bucket. Um, so one, practice that talk track. You know, you, you likely have a mentor either within or without the company that can help coach you on that. Um, definitely take them up on it. it. It's a challenging conversation to have. I would also say that there's another state of being for growth stage companies and thinking of their next round of financing. 
Like there, we are not too far away in my view of getting back to very robust funding rounds that are predicated on growth as opposed to profitability, you know, similar an echo of what we had in 2021. Um, if and when those times do come about, I would, ha- I would resist the desire to take as much money or rather take as much money at the highest valuation you can accrue. Um, and, and, he, and the reason why is just looking around at the current slate of companies that can go public now. There are basically, of the companies that we're speaking with, there are two types. One that has yet to grow into their valuation, that is just sky high, or those that actually were moderate in terms of their fundraising and valuation expectations and can actually go out today at a multiple to their last uh, valuation. And you certainly want to be in the second camp as opposed to the first, um, because those questions, even if you have the mathematical linearity of saying, if I take a conservative multiple and apply it to my revenue or EBITDA margin, et cetera, blah, 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 find out my valuation. The investor public and those that you meet with for future investment, they will ask you the questions about you know growth into that valuation and further push you on that. I mean, just the the higher your valuation figure is, um, you know, the more that you will get pushed. And so, you know, I don't necessarily want to say leave money on the table. I'm not, but I am being being very honest with you is that sometimes moderation can be the best long term investment. Mm. Mm-hmm. And again, that wise advice that everyone here has offered is saying it really is a journey. And so the moment is a moment, but it's it's not the final destination that's still being written as you go through. And that That is equally important in the story. All right. I am getting ready for my last question because we've got some wonderful questions coming in from our audience today. Thank you all so much for, for uh, highlighting the areas that you'd like us to go a little deeper into. And, and here it is. And it's a simple one. Um, if with all the experience that you have you've brought to the stage today, what is the one key takeaway that you wish everyone would sort of leave with, armed with, and thinking about how they can prepare successfully uh, to enter or consider entering this IPO transaction? So I'm um, going to once again start with Gordon, Dan, and then I round it out with Francois, and we'll go into audience Q&A from there. So Gordon? Yeah, I, I would say building a great company will help you no matter what. And so taking the right steps to build out your company in a thoughtful way, build out good governance practices, build out the right personnel, that's going to help you no matter what your next step is. And so taking those right steps to do that Mm -hmm. is only going to be a positive. Here's to the positives. Thank you, Gordon. Dan. I think it's just budgeting out uh, as much time. Let me put it this way. A lot of the most successful um, IPO founders have actually budgeted into their day uh, time to think. Think about what, not very clear, but they extract themselves from the hustle and bustle of, you know, process and, 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 and to do lists just to think about the most pressing elements. So going back to Gordon's comment, whether that's building the best business or uh, whether it's thinking about your strategy to engage, um, you know, investors or build everlasting board relationships that are, that are promising. You have to be in, incredibly intentional about all of these things and extricate yourself from things that take away your attention, um, even if they might be important. So investing time into thinking, (laughs) definitely my own. It's just a strategic prioritization for our C-suite. Very good. Very good. Francois. Yeah, it's very similar to what Gordon and Dan were mentioning. I mean, if you're going to go down the IPO process and that's the path you're going to go down, then start as early as possible, right? But at the same time, you know, I've seen businesses that spend all their time on raising money. And if all you're doing is, to Dan's point, if all you're really doing is just focusing on how to continue to raise capital, then you won't have time to spend focusing on the business. And essentially, then the business won't be the business that you want it to be. And the capital will eventually dry up because there will not be a business here. So, you know, if you're going to raise money, make sure you raise the right amount for the right things that you're going to actually, you know, your KPIs and whatever it is you're going to do, but then keep focusing on your business because that's what people invest in. It's the business. Wonderful. Okay, Francois, we're, we're staying with you. 
um, because I've, I've got a question that's been directed to you. Um, and that's really around this issue of focusing in on the business versus sort of focusing externally. In your experience as, you know, being the CFO during this moment in time, what did it look like on internal versus external priorities? Like from a benchmark, how much time did you say, I've got to be focused on really building and growing the business versus I need to be focused on really getting through and building out our success uh, for our IPL? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and they're going to give like the lawyer type answer, which is well, it depends. It depends, <laughs> yes. right? But, right? But it's a it's a, a, it's a lot of what Gordon and Dan also were mentioning. I think you've got to you've got to be able to build a team internally that you can then rely on to keep running the business, right? But if you're the CEO, CFO, to Dan's point. You have to be out in the marketplace. You have to be telling the story about your business. And if if you've not been trained in it, you like Dan mentioned, you have to have that media training because you've got to tell, Gordon mentioned this as well, you've got to tell the story of your business. And it, here's where it gets really strange because everyone who's in that company, who's in that business, well, you know it. You live it day in and day out. But you've now got to be able to take it and craft that story so that others understand it and others want to buy into it. So as you're going along on that IPO journey, you know, at the front end, very early, you know, early in the in the process, you're going to focus a lot on the business. But as you're going through, as you're looking to get out into the marketplace, and especially, really, especially once you get right through doing the uh, the roadshow and then post IPO. You've got to do a lot of external facing events to make sure that the momentum continues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, whether you need training or whether you're natural at it, one of the things you've got to be able to do for certain roles within a company is like adapt and change rapidly, internal, external, back to internal, back to external. Um, and, you, and, and like things can happen that you just don't even plan about. Maybe there's an event that occurred, good or bad. And suddenly you were thinking you were going to do something internally that day and all of a sudden you've got to pivot and do something external. So that's a skill set one needs to have as you're thinking about running and growing your business. Yeah, back to that dynamic advice that we got from Dan on making sure you've got time to be strategic so that you can really prioritize and make sure that you can pivot when needed. Um all right, Dan, a, a lot of uh, appreciation for the tips and insights on a uh, be ready to invest your time going live to build relationships. Uh, questions coming in around, okay, my friend, could you give us tips on which conferences we might want to prioritize? Uh, how do we find these elusive, really strong uh, cell analysts that are going to fall in love with our companies? How do we think through uh, really building out meaningful relationships? Certainly. So um, one of the easiest processes to do it um, is to speak with current investors and um, and board members and just leverage their networks. I mean, even investors, like if, if I'm using an extreme example, but if Andreessen or, you know, the Sequoia called up Goldman Sachs one day, something tells me that they would roll out the, uh, the, the red carpet. It's similar for any other investor that has a reasonable network. They, um, you know, banks want to cater to them. And the investors, by the way, um, are in a privileged position to really define what you're trying to figure out and say, if you're not ready to talk on these particular items, then, you know, let's not meet. Um, and then that really focuses the banking partners and analysts to uh, be responsive. But if let's say you wanted to do a more bootstrap approach or, you know, using it in different strategies as well, um, the uh, JMP private company conference um, is it's in San Francisco uh, once a year. I, I think it's, geez, I want to say February, but I might be wrong. Um, but that happens to be a very good starting off point for, um, you know, for a private company uh, that's looking to gain access to, you know, the sell side analysts, investors, um, it's just a very well thought out, um, you know, event. Of course, you want to uh, eventually graduate towards the Morgan Stanley Tech Conference or, you know, anything having, if you're in a life science or healthcare capacity, it, you know, being very intentional and setting up shops somewhere where you can be very active during JP Morgan. 
Um, and if you're in cybersecurity as well, like um, RSA is, is something that, you know, regardless of size, you, you should be going to. Each one of these either um, sector based conferences or bank specific conferences, they will have, you know, the, the groups that you are looking to engage with, they will be at your fingertips. All that you really need is to go out to them on a cold basis or have an intro. And there are certain resources that can help you with cold outreach. NASDAQ has um, data that can be useful from that standpoint. And then also, um, you know, other, you know, software. So, it, you know, there's always ways to get there, but I, I hope that's helpful. Incredibly helpful, incredibly helpful. All right, so here's my last question for our amazing panel today. Represented here, as I've said, are incredible advisors that should be in your treasure trove of success as you think about arming yourself successfully for going through this process and the journey that is. But who's not present here that you would also encourage our management teams to think about surrounding themselves with when it comes to advisors, when it comes to other support systems that can really change the course of help and assistance for founders who feel uh, understandably so, that this is a Wild West journey they're on. So in no particular order, I'll just open it up to to our group to add in um, others that they should seek help from. I'll, I'll start there if you don't mind, Nicola. I, th I think, you know, if founders, if you've never been through this process, it's worthwhile talking to founders who have been through this process. And I'll give you an example of why I say that. Because as you're going through the process, you will need to start to build what's known as internal controls into your business. Mm -hmm. And if you're a founder of a company, you just suddenly start to hear things like internal controls, processes, and things like that. And it's just an anathema. It's like, no, I want to grow my business. Putting that stuff in place seems to want to slow things down. My engineers are going to hate me, so on and so forth. And that's a natural reaction, and I see it time and time again. But if you can talk to some other CEO that's been through the process, we can then help you understand why it's needed. We as advisors will always tell you why it's needed. But to hear it from some other founder that had to go through it and understand why they had to go through it, I think that helps to really set the scene in the mind as to why that's important. So just my five cents on that one. Love yeah. that. That's awesome, Francois. I, I would say um, I'm going to take a completely 180 degree left turn here uh, from what I've spoken about previously. I, I think as a founder or anyone in the C-suite for any growth stage company, there is a lot of um, emotional and mental health um, obligations that you're going to be assuming as your company starts ramping. Um, it's going to create a feeling and, and I'm it's unfortunate, but it's going to create a certain element and feeling of isolation because you're progressively becoming the point person for an organization that is growing rapidly. Your family might not understand outside of the work hours that you put in just how much you know is writing upon your performance, um, things of that nature, right? And so you could see that you need a support structure to do that. And so finding peers um, that you can be as friendly and real with as possible. There's even, um, you know, organizations called, uh, I might be mispronouncing this, but Junta or Junta, J-U-N-T-A, that organizes executive engagements um, and social events just so they can actually have kind of escape valves to release pressure uh, with like-minded audiences, it will make a big deal and difference because you need that release in, you know, a very substantial way as you continue to scale. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. And, and I'll go on a, a slightly lighter note. I'll, I'll say your your kids, if you have them, or, or small children, family members, because I think one of the things that's incredibly important that we've emphasized a lot is, is the story here. And being able to tell your story, but not only being able to tell your story, but being able to tell it in a very concise, understandable way. If you're going out and meeting with investors, if you're doing an interview on CNBC, you're giving these quick, brief answers of these incredibly complex businesses and business issues. And so if you can distill that down into something that a five-year-old or a seven-year-old might understand, that's going to be an incredibly valuable skill set for you. 
Uh, Gordon, as a mom of a six and a five-year-old, I could not agree more. You have a narrow window to get through. <laughs> you better do it as quickly and efficiently as you can. What a treat this has been. Thank you all so much. Uh, the insights, the guidance. Our, our goal was to come in and disseminate best practices, and you did that and some. So thank you to our rock stars uh, for their contributions. And uh, Colin, back to you. Thank you, Nicola, for leading such a great discussion. Gordon, Francois, Dan, thank you all for sharing your expertise and insights. We look forward to welcoming you back soon. For everybody on, we're going to switch into our next panel, Executing Your IPO. So as you settle in, we want to get a better idea of who we have joining us for the session. So I'm going to launch a quick poll in the next 12 to 18 months. Are you looking into starting the IPO process? Head in that direction, not quite yet. Yes, but within not within that time frame. So let us know. This will give our panelists a better idea of where they should focus their content. Awesome. Well, let's end that poll and share those results. Looks like a pretty good mix. So looking forward to our next panel. So without any further delay, Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our next group of experts. Our moderator, Tara Ryan, is a CMO at Seviant. We have Jack Castle, head of new listings at NASDAQ. And we have John Michael Kretz, May managing director at deal advisory at KPMG. And we have Liana Whittleton, partner at Wilson Sonsini. Welcome, team. And Tara, over to you. Wonderful. Um, for some reason, it won't allow me to start my video, but I'll get I'll get you going. I think I've got the big. There we go. And over to you. All right, team. Fantastic. Thank you, thank you very thank you very much. So we are here on executing um, our IPOs, um, and we have some wonderful guests here. Um, I've got. Um, all right, here we go. Sorry, I'm just getting into my notes here. Um, uh, I will be moderating for the next uh, 30, 40 minutes. We have Jack Castle here, um, head of listings at NASDAQ, John Michael Kretz, Manage direct, managing director and deal advisory at KPMG, and Leanna Whittleton, partner at Wilson Sonsini. Are we all here? Here, ready to go. Hi guys, thanks for joining. Um, wow, I, I mean, as we were on a call the other day um, and we were just listening, it is about the story and the journey and I can't help but think of, you know, some some Ted Lasso comparisons and, um, but it really is about the team and um, when it comes to executing and, and how, as we all know, um, what becomes time as essence and um, those teams and the key roles and responsibilities um, and how we all come together as part of executing that IPO. So um, I'm going to go around and ask specific um, questions. And Jack, I'd love to start with you. Um, again, thanks for joining. And I'd love to ask you, you know, what do you see as the key components of a successful IPO roadshow? Yeah, I think, you know, that first session covered so many elements leading up to those key components of a successful roadshow. And I think Dan really covered it well on starting early. So, you know, for the roadshow, you're going to really have about eight to nine intense days of meeting with investors. You'll have one on one meetings, you'll have large group meetings, small group meetings. You'll be sharing your presentation, doing Q&A. So as early as you can start that process, several quarters before of meeting with investors, starting that feedback loop, because in a lot of instances, there's questions as much as you know that business well, you haven't thought about how to answer that question, or do you need to pivot in another direction? Are there common themes in that feedback or that Q&A that uh, will help to really shape uh, your story as you get to the roadshow. So I think one key element that I'll probably discuss a few times is starting early, but then to that roadshow uh, is really getting prepared to take kind of really this, you know, long winded uh, S1 filing and truncating that down to a, a very direct investor presentation. And maybe I'll hit those key components, but it's a investor specific presentation that tells your story that has the right qualitative element to it, but as well as the quantitative element, uh, you wanna practice that Q and A and really nail that. So think about those questions, but also prepare that, do some dry runs, 
uh, with either you know your team, your comms team, um, your advisors, et cetera. But what are some of those commonly or FAQs, if you will? Um, but also what what's something outside the box that you could get asked? We're hearing that a lot right now around AI. So companies that might not have AI as part of their story, a lot of investors want to know, is this a headwind or is this a tailwind? Uh, another key component is your roadshow video. So our recommendation is invest in your roadshow video. That usually launches or goes public on day one of your roadshow. So for some investors, that'll be their first impression of the company. And those videos are typically around 30 to 45 minutes. You can see some online at um, one that comes to mind is retailroadshow.com. You can see some of the companies that are currently on the road right now. You can click there and, and watch some of their videos. But you can also quickly see those that have an impressive video, kind of a commercial, to those that haven't necessarily invested well in it. And, and again, as a consumer, is that somebody that you believe their story and wanted to invest in? And it takes a lot of planning and perfecting to really get that right. And also it has to be consistent with your SEC filings, uh, all the legal, the financial, everything um, that you've been kind of having your S1 and you've been telling the street, you need to have that concise in that video. Uh, so I'd say those are really kind of probably three of the four key components. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And as as a CMO, I yeah, I hate to see all that work and all that practice and all that prep and Q&A and media training and then not have the video be as strong as that. Right. Um, so I I've run down the hallways like, wait, wait, we you know, we can do better on that video. So thanks so much for that. Um, Leanna, um, a question for you. Um, what do you see as some of the key roles and responsibilities within the company um, during the IPO preparation phase? Again, sort of back to that team, the, the, the key roles and responsibilities. Yeah, it's a good question and so happy to be here. Nice to, to speak with everybody. Um, you know, I think there are a number of different work streams and I'm going to keep it a little bit high level. There's obviously quite a few components, right? But I think there is a diligence work stream, right? Which is both your historical diligence and then backup for the statements you're going to make in your filings. Then there's your financials, right? And John Michael knows that one even better than I do. Um, then I think there's the business section, the marketing, the story, the roadshow, right? Sort of your IR component. And then what I'm going to call sort of the back half, the rest of the required obligations and then some of the corporate governance uh, work streams as well. But I think what's probably more interesting for you all is not so much what are those categories, right? I think at a high level, your GC and your CFO are generally going to drive and oversee those. But really, as you're looking to get ready for an IPO, thinking about your management team, right? Who, what skill sets do you have? And frankly, what personalities do you have, right? Do you have a clear vision of the story that you're going to tell? Or do you have a really great product, a great model, but you're going to bring in third parties, right? To help tell that story. You're relying on your bankers to really hone the message that's compelling, right? Um, Frankly, what are your board members like? How active are they, right? And I think being clear-eyed about the strengths that you have currently or where you want to backfill or who you need to manage is actually almost more important than the check the box, you know, these are the roles and things that we're going to need to work through. So, you know, often in these drafting sessions, it'll be GC that leads, but I've been in meetings where the CEO leads, right? And they're there and they have lots of thoughts about the business section, right? And they're really kind of driving it. Other times they say, well, we have a really strong marketing head. You know, they're not IR, but they've been telling the story on the product, they're going to lead, right? And so I think figuring out internally whose role is going to be helpful, because then you don't have friction or, oh, goodness, I didn't talk to so-and-so, right? Um, you know, I had an IPO where we spent a month drafting the business section. We did all our drafting sessions in person. It's a little, you know, back, I'll say back in the day. Um, and at the printers, the CEO goes, that's not the story I want to tell, Right. And he and one banker and kind of our senior lawyer went to a room and they rewrote it. Right. And the rest of us like, OK, <laughs> so I do think a lot of the work streams like you will get checklists from everybody. Right. But really, it's probably more thinking about what assets you have internally, where you need to build out or just being aware and clear eyed about um, who you think you need to have involved from an operational perspective. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. No, again, um, 
I remember one time our head of SEs, the sales engineers ended up being, you know, the more astute person on really what that product and platform makeup was to answer, you know, tough questions. So um, agree. It's those, you know, not necessarily what you think of out of the book, out of the textbook, as far as those roles and responsibilities. Um, uh, John Michael, a question for you. You know, what do you see as some of the common accounting principles and standards that companies must adhere to, you know, when preparing the financial statements for the IPO? Yeah, good question. Thanks, Tara. Um, so the core accounting principles remain the same for a private company and a public company. So assuming you're a U.S. company, you will be required to comply with the U.S. GAAP. But there is a very significant uplift in reporting and other requirements for companies entering the public market. So arguably the most impactful, at least from an accounting perspective, is that transition from a private company reporting to SEC reporting uh, disclosure requirements. Um, and with that change, your, your disclosures are significantly increased. So you'll bring in things like reportable segments, which are not required for private companies, uh, but are for public filers. Share-based compensation required for private, but has much more prominence um, in SEC filings. Uh, you may have other requirements like uh, significant acquisitions. If they meet certain thresholds, you may be required to include separate uh, acquiree financial statements within your filing. And most other topics, uh, assets, revenues, have more rigorous disclosure requirements for the SEC as compared to a private company. Um, you'll also need to include in your S-1 and in, in your future periodic filings, so your 10-Ks uh, filed annually, your 10-Qs filed quarterly, uh, a management's discussion and analysis section or md &A. and that is often new, um, at least in the form or rigor that's required for a public company. So you may have private company financial statements that include an md &A, but you're going from a couple of pages to 20, 40 pages of md &A. Uh, so significant more uh, in addition for a, a public company. I mean, it, it and, and the introduction of those MD&A requirements may even challenge the way you evaluate the company's performance by introducing new KPIs. I know there was a discussion on KPIs in the last session. Um, agree, you might not want to introduce significant new KPIs, but you should look at your peer set and make sure that you are evaluated consistently so that an investor understands or can compare uh, similar companies. From an audit perspective, so that's financial disclosure. From an audit perspective, you'll move from an audit performed under AICPA standards uh, as a private company to uh, as a public company, one that is performed under PCAOB or what's known as the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. And those standards are much more prescriptive. The audit is sig significantly more robust, means more procedures required, um, meaning more rigor on existing accounts that are considered material. Audit firms also under a PCAOB audit will generally use a lower materiality. So Transactions that previously were not considered material may be now, um, which increases the amount of work as well. So you've got more disclosures, uh, which will be audited with a lower materiality threshold. So you can see the writing on the wall. It's much more significant. Um, I, I also look at controls. Um, I think you, you need to be considering SOX or Sarbanes-Oxley requirements, which will apply to all public companies, although... Um, it depends on the size of the company as to when you will have to be in full compliance. Even initial filers right out of the gate with your first regular filing will have to have some form of certification immediately. So you'll want to think about that and what that means for the company as far as controls that are in place or governance that's in place. And then lastly, I, I think about ESG. And I know that's kind of a hot button topic recently. Uh, SEC's climate rule is under stay while lit litigation is resolved here. But uh, as it's currently drafted, large accelerated filers would have to comply on 2025 information that's that's filed in 2026. And so that's right around the corner. Um, certainly something that something to think about uh, as you 
as you transition to a public company. Yeah, thank you. Wow, what a list. I feel like a lot. we could yeah. publish that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, uh, again, the evidence of teamwork, right? Um, Jack, here's one for you. Um, how does a company develop an effective investor relations strategy? I know um, I've been in those, you know, execution modes with IR and PR and um, many team members coming together, but um, to engage with potential investors um, around investor relations strategy, um, how do how do companies develop that? Yeah, I think, well, you nailed it. And I and piggyback it a little on John Michael's point there. It starts with really creating a compelling story. Mm -hmm. uh, so sharing the company's journey, the successes you ha have had, the KPIs, the market share, but also uh, to John Michael's point, keeping it simple and understandable, making this a, a very digestible part of the content here that uh, people can quickly understand and kind of get to the questions they need answered on whether they'd want to invest or not. Um, then two, and a bit piggybacking on that, uh, the roadshow uh, commentary is just meeting with those key players. And I think one piece is, you know, in addition to the investors, there will be some investors that will not invest in the IPO, whether they want to or not. Some just don't get the allocation or, or the allocation they'd like to. And mm -hmm. some that you know, maybe just didn't have the appetite at IPO, but several quarters after the company continues to uh, achieve their goals, um, then says, okay, this is something we'd like to look uh, more diligently at. So continue to keep that rost of invest roster of investors, but I'd say in addition to the investors, also starting to meet with the analysts, the sell side uh, that will be covering their stocks. And, uh, and where that becomes a key element is again, ensuring that they understand your story and in a very sim similar Q and A and interaction. Uh, but for a lot of companies, they may teeter on who their comps are. They may have a particular short list of companies that they actually compare to, or maybe their aspirational peers. But if the analyst, say, no, we have you over here in this bucket, but it's a different valuation, maybe a different revenue or even a multiple, you wanna try and pull them back over to really see that value. So it's a, a key element of, of meeting those key players. Um, a third piece I'd say is uh, a, similar to the video is also a quality IR website. So this is something that NASDAQ offers as part of um, you know the IPO package, if you will. But this can also be a first impression for investors post IPO. They come to your website, they wanna learn a little bit more about the company. And if you have a built out robust IR landing page or website, now they can find that relevant pertinent information. And uh, again, quickly make a decision if they want to engage or, or schedule time with you. Um, the fourth piece I'd say there is having a, a really firm schedule. Um, even small missteps or changes of plans can uh, really, you know, have or stir doubts in for investors or analysts. So making sure that you kind of build that out. Best practice is really a year. What conferences uh, do you want to attend? When are your shareholder meetings? Um, when are your earning release dates? So really having being reliable and credible on where you're going to be meeting with individuals as well as how you'll be deploying that information. Uh, and then the fifth piece or the last piece I'd say is just plan for bad news, right? It's uh, part of business and transparency is a key element to, to business, let alone investor relations. So thinking about what are the challenges the business will face and having a, a you know, good response to that, getting ahead of those potential challenges or bad news and, and being transparent with the investor or the broader ecosystem is gonna bode well for the company. Yeah, thanks so much. I think that flexibility, and I think it was in the previous session, just even when, even when someone brought up family, but you know, if one, then what do we do? You know, um, even when someone gets sick, you know, on a road show or, um, you know, how do you plan for adjustments and, and also be very consistent at the same time? So um, thanks for that. Um, Liana, here's one. Um, what are the potential risks and challenges related to compliance during and after the IPO? So compliance is a, a very big again. Oh, these are big questions. So yeah. I thank you for honing in. But yeah, 
No, of course. Um, you know, I will say when you're thinking about preparing for an IPO, you know, one of the things I tell companies is I almost don't care to the questionnaire that they had in the beginning, sort of how far out you are, right? The further out you are, the more you can control the operational pieces. And this is going to get to how I think about compliance, right? Is when someone says, okay, call it 12 to 18 months out, what should I be doing? Not drafting the business section of the S1, right? But what you should be doing is saying, okay, you know, what do our departments look like? What are our processes, right? Have we been thinking about some of what I'm going to call the reputational issues that are going to come up? Right. And so compliance usually first rears its head in diligence. Right. Your underwriters are going to look under the hood across the board because they need to know that you guys have been running this company in the way that you should have. Right. And that's what I'm calling operational. And so it really is. Were you doing the things you always should have been doing entirely separate from the offering? Right. And in that entire work stream. And so, you know, it's very frequent. We see voluntary OFAC submissions. Right. Because we start auditing and say, oh, gosh, there were a couple IP addresses in countries we should not have been allowing access to. Right. Um, you know, cyber issues, right? What are your policies even look like? Do you have a policy sitting on the shelf and no one knows it's there, right? Like, are you actually implementing a lot of the things that you should be just from a best practices perspective, right? Privacy is another, you know, headline issue. And then I think compliance also depends a little bit on the industry you're in, right? So for example, if you're in crypto, the regulatory framework, right, is going to be far more scrutinized than if you're in another sector. And so I think that tends to be the first wave of questions you get. And what can be hard for, for you all is you know there's an offering going on, but the rest of the organization doesn't. And so you're asking questions, right, of all of these folks, like, how do we do this, right? And what is our sales team being told? And are we sure they're not doing side agreements relative to the main contracts they're funding up? And just asking. <laughs> so um, I do think when you're thinking about prep, right, getting ready, looking at the what, what are the best practices now, all of that can serve you really, really well to address that big, huge, you know, compliance boulder that you're going to face right, right on. Um, I think the second piece of compliance is really the financial timelines. Um, you know, the the IPO count, everyone wants to know, right? How fast can we go out? What's the first thing to file? My question is always, well, what do your financials look like, right? And how quickly can you guys close a quarter, right? And the timing and the windows are driven so much by when your financials are ready, when they go stale, when the next quarter is required. And so kind of looking at that internal structure as well, I think can drive a lot of the, are we ready to go or not? You know, John Michael said this in, in his opening remarks, like, did you have a significant acquisition? And did you think about the fact that we might actually have to incorporate those financials backward and forward potentially, right? And that's not usually things that are required for a private company. And so getting ahead of some of those I'm going to call it sort of compliance requirements from a financial perspective can also be long holes in the tent. Um, you know, it's not unusual that we find that there's a material weakness, right? And we end up having the risk factors around that because you were stepping up your organization, right? And everything wasn't necessarily done all by the book. And you do have phase-ins, but some of those requirements you start getting ahead of, right? So I think a lot of those items tend to come up early on. After the IPO, I think the focus changes a little bit, right? And the hope is that through that offering, right, you are kind of running through and, and hitting a lot of those headline items. Um, but once you're public, there can be footfalls, right, that require disclosure. And that disclosure regime, you know, can be militant, right? There are hard deadlines that you need to be complying with. And so I tend to tell companies, you know, we, we being your third party advisor as a whole, we can get you across the line to the offering. But I want you to think about building out your g &A team the day after you go public, right? Like, who do you have in finance, right? You know, you need to be building out this team because folks have to flag things for you proactively, right? Before you go, oops, like that happened. And actually two days ago, we had to disclose that information, right? So then compliance starts to change and you've got now that SEC layer of, well, gosh, section 16 filings, right? Have a two-day trigger. So you might be zeroed in on your periodic reports, your financial requirements, your 8Ks, and then your CEO sells shares and didn't mention it, right? Didn't realize they had to mention it, right? Or we're looking at a 10B51 plan and didn't quite understand how the mechanics work. So I think that adds an extra layer where as much as you're looking to be mindful of cost, I think that steps up pretty significantly, right? And compliance often means less of those operational issues and more of the, what is that new regime that we need to be layering on top of everything that we're complying with already? Oh yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. I mean, I love that, that 
before. I mean, there really isn't a department within a company that isn't involved. Um, I know I've had that with just GDPR and contact databases and marketing. And my team was wondering, why am I so worried about pipeline and salesforce.com? And, and it really was about like being able to be prepared to show our pipeline as an asset of the company and, and what, what was going on in the back office there um, in addition to GNA. So thanks for that great answer. Um, John Michael, um, Here's a good one. Uh, what strategies can companies employ to effectively communicate their value props and investment thesis to prospective um, shareholders? Yeah, yeah, good question. I, I know uh, in the prior session, and, and Jack's touched on it here as well, there's this element of storytelling. Um, I think value proposition should be woven uh, or, or investment thesis should be woven into that story. And I think that story, the effective communication of that story is critical to attract the right investors. So I think this very basic mes effective messages should be clear, concise, compelling. They should be easily understood by potential investors that probably or, or may not fully understand the background or complexity of your business. Um, I would have those stories delivered by someone who is well-trained really understands the business generally that's your ceo cfo marketing team investor relations and then plan to direct or uh, uh, interact directly with group tailored groups right figure out work with your bankers your underwriters to figure out what is your target group um let's section that off let's go talk to those people individually or those institutions individually part of that can be done on your roadshow but there's other elements we've already talked about videos um you know i think you should again jack said this but be transparent um highlight the successes and opportunities present in that value proposition but be honest about the challenges or uncertainties that your business faces and i think that really helps build credibility and trust and it makes the story more impactful um as you engage that right audience again help you know, seek help in defining your investor targets um, and, and where that message will resonate best. Um, consider investor history, focus areas, uh, lots of things to think about there, but you really want to hone that message for the group. Um, I think, you know, even go as fundament fundamental as what method of communication are you using? Um, and you should use all channels available. Um, stories, endorsements, visuals, you know, your numbers need to support your story. Um, and if they don't, that can be a real valuation issue. Um, but obviously use those traditional methods available, it, investor presentations, your, your reports, press releases, um, and, and make those as productive as possible. But complement those with you know, maybe less traditional methods, if you will. So your website, um, or, or pretty common today, websites, social media, newsletters, and be consistent in your storytelling, not just in the message itself, but in the frequency of delivering that message. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain circumstances where you're, you'll only get one shot at delivering a message. Maybe it's one one meeting with a large institutional investor and you get one chance, Okay. That's not necessarily the case if you're blasting it through your, your uh, social media account, your website, whatever the case, to tell a story about your corporate journey and why your value proposi proposition is differentiated from others. And I think if you use the right combination of strategies, there's not one silver bullet, a combination of strategies for your company and your, your investor base. I think you'll find a success. Yeah, I'd love to have you come tell a couple CEOs that <laughs> um, I always say, you know, it's it. I I love it when it's two years, but a, a two year road where I can drop some breadcrumbs along the way, oh, right? Sure. At, at some point, there's going to be a research assistant or an investor, prospective investor, that's going to read my archives of press releases on the website, you know, from three years ago, they want to see momentum press releases. They want to see customer stories. Um, 
And so, you know, the transparency as well as, you know, choosing maybe non-traditional, it doesn't always have to be, you know, a press release, but what, what will they, what forms that story? Um, so that's great. Thanks. Um, and then Jack, um, here's one. Um, this is interesting. We, you know, just key milestones. What do you see as key milestones and the timelines that are involved in preparing an IPO? And we've heard a little bit more earlier, but, you know, from initial planning to final offering. Yeah, I think um, I'll start with key milestones and then a little bit on timeline. So with key milestones, I think one of the biggest things, and Leanna touched upon it, we've done a handful of kind of that compiled checklist, but uh, one of the biggest things is just going to be predictability in your model, uh, especially, you know, outside of pre-revenue, life science or biotech companies, but for kind of the every other sector, if you will, uh, having predictability in your revenue model. You really want to have those first three, four quarters in line of sight so that once you get out the gates as a public company, you're kind of beating and raising, right, each your estimates each quarter. Uh, and unfortunately, for those companies that miss a particular quarter, even our large mega caps, uh, they get penalized in the public markets. So outside of you know everything that you have to have ready to to go public from a systems, from an audit, from a filing, from management experience, et cetera, uh, having that predictability in the revenue model is a key component. Um, and then I'd say it, again, as John Michael mentioned, you know the decision to go public really is probably eighteen to twenty four months prior. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you're running a lot of parallel streams there. But then as you fast forward to, okay, let's let's go. The board makes a decision. We want to go. Uh, then you start to kind of truncate that down to about a six-month window where you're going to hire your lead investment banks. Um, typically, it's your kind of one and two. You'll have outside counsel, usually your issuer counsel. And then in some instances, you'll have your underwriter counsel. And then they'll all come together for an org meeting. So that, again, about six months out, then you'll start drafting that S1 that Leanna had mentioned before. And you really want to get that into a good spot so that you could submit that confidentially to the SEC. And with that submission, you'll have this comment period. And uh, I, she can speak on it a little better than than I can, but what we're seeing broadly in the market, you wanna give yourself at least four to six weeks just because it can take them 20 to 30 days uh, to, to provide that com those comments. So, you know, it, it really goes back to uh, how much you invest in getting that S1 right initially, because that will decrease the amount of comments you get back. But unfortunately with the SEC and, you know, knock on wood, the momentum continues. We haven't had as many IPOs. so. Uh, it seems like the SEC is taking a little bit longer to flip those comments back. Um, but then once you get that thumbs up, we're good with the SEC, the S1's in a good place. Uh, then you have a more defined timeline. When do we want to flip this public? You know, typically we see S1's file publicly on a Friday or a Monday. That'll start the quiet period for about 15 days. And then you'll get into the roadshow uh, that we touched upon about, uh, again, eight to nine days have your pricing committee meet at the final day of your roadshow, decide where you're going to price the deal, um, understand the allocations for those different investors, and then come to NASDAQ the following day for your IPO. Sounds like a little bit of like American Idol. <laughs> you're going <laughs> to New York. <laughs> yes, get your yellow, your yellow ticket. ticket. <laughs> but um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And um, in my experience, you know, I've even challenged with a CFO saying, hey, why don't we just draft what we would see as an, an earnings script for the second quarter, right, out yeah. post IPO, because, you know, continually challenging yourself to think, you know, what, it's not just about this, you know, six week period, it's about what, you know, what is that predictability that, you know, we want to in, um, build into the process. Um, Leanna, um, what are the key legal documents and agreements um, involved in the IPO, um, uh, you know, such as the prospectus and underwriting agreements, but um, legal documents? Sure. So everyone pays attention to the S1, right, which I think is good. That is the core document. 
Um, but that is, while the biggest, right, only one of many, many little pieces here. So, you know, I do think the underwriting agreement is an important component, but I'm going to put that more in legal, right? So if you are IR, finance, marketing, you're a little bit less concerned on it, other than the comfort letter and the CFO cert, right? That kind of loops back to some of the stats and things you're putting into, again, that main headline S1. Um, I, I think companies often downplay or, or don't realize how much work the TTW materials then the road shows and then any pre-writing prospectuses you do while on the road take and how much that has to loop back to the S1. So, so frequently they say, okay, legal's running the S1 and we'll put I over here. And then I get a copy of the road show deck and say, oh, I'm sorry. We have to say only the things that we said over here, right? We've got to marry up some of these concepts and some of these phrases. And so I think kind of coordinating on that front end uh, tends to be something that folks often just don't have at the forefront of their minds. Um, another piece I think is important is the financial analyst model. Right. And kind of what you're building for your long term model, how you're helping analysts understand your model and sort of softly coaching them to build something that ends up consistent with what you're messaging. Right. And I think that can often be a larger work stream than folks expect. And there's no document per se attached to that. Right. But it is something that you need to be tracking. Um, and then compensation. Right. And I think there's two pieces to this. One is the comp disclosures in the S1. Right. And I think a lot of our executives say, I want to be an officer, right? I want to be listed as an executive officer in the S1. I want my name and my photo and my bio. And we say, okay, and now we're going to describe all of your compensation historically. And they say, whoa, <laughs> everyone gets to see that, right? Um, so I think there's the disclosure component of it. And then the work stream to think about how public company compensation might be different from private company compensation, right? Or it is an opportunity to right size everything. What you should be doing is benchmarking, right? Because now you're also be, going to be in defensive mode a little bit for why you pay folks the way that you do. And when you get to your proxy, there's a whole bunch of CEO pay ratio and other disclosures, right? And so I think um, companies are often a little bit surprised by how much effort goes into exec comp, director comp, thinking about those new equity plans, understanding what an ESPP is. And once you understand it, explain to your employees what an ESPP is, right? And why is that good? And those offering periods start right after, you know, the IPO is closed. So you launch almost immediately into these employee comms. And so I think that entire work stream, um, again, not at the forefront of the mind, but can be a lot of both work and important decisions, right? For an organization as a whole. It's not, you know, legal and I sit in the background and check all these boxes. We've got to coordinate with HR. We've got to make sure the CEO knows what we're doing and that it fits with the culture and the structure and what you've done holistically. Um, and then the last bucket, I think, is corporate governance policies. So I touched on, you know, ideally, operationally, you've got your FCPA policy, right? And you're kind of doing all these things you're supposed to be doing. But we will layer on a bunch of extra disclosure, right? And so some of it's related to things like insider trading, which matters once you're public, right? Or, you know, Reg FD and making sure your disclosures publicly are consistent with what you know internally. But there will be a whole host of policies that we roll out. A lot of it is form, but the forms are only as good as the folks that know what the forms say and know to follow them, right? And so that, I think, often is something that is weighted to the end of the process and can be a little bit sort of surprising. Um, I think the other piece of it is the consents, right? So your board is in the know, right? And there's a bunch of series, like your org meeting, your first confidential filing, your public filing. There'll be these big, lengthy consents with a billion attachments, right, that you walk the board through. Um, but I think often... Companies don't always think about the stockholder consent and the public disclosure. So your public filing is not just that S1 you've been working on for two months, but, oh gosh, now we need like an employee messaging work stream and a customer messaging work stream, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of these customers we named, not all the customers, right? Some of them we looked at logo usage and, you know, thinking around that third party engagement and also seeking whatever consents and things that you're going to chase at the same time so you can actually implement on all of this. So I think those are the, the buckets I think about in terms of the legal documents, um, you know, timing of signing is also always an interesting one. And there's some things you sign up front, some on effectiveness, some on close. But I think that tends to be more on the administrative side. I'm trying to focus on some of the gotchas for, for you all in the audience. Thank you so much. And I it, it, it brings back, I mean, to me, getting ahead of it and just being aware in advance, I mean, even how much your culture will be affected when compensations are published. Um, you know, how do you manage that through the entire way? Um, and uh, 
So yeah, being more organized in advance and thinking about those things that aren't as obvious. Um, another question here, John Michael, um, have you seen any IPOs stall um, and any reasons maybe they may have stalled? Yeah, well, absolutely. Your experience. Um, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> IPOs stall all the time and for a whole host of reasons. Um, I think at least recently in my mind, the biggest is just overall economic conditions. So is there or is there not a recession? Um, interest rate challenges, which maybe constricts capital. Do we have domestic or even international political issues or change in our US politics? Um, all of that in fact affects investor sentiment and, and, and can delay an offering just by itself. Um, you'll often hear discussion of a market window and essentially what that means is the market conditions are right for your company to enter the public markets. And I think entry within a viable window is a really important consideration to, to optimize the value for the organization and, and uh, current, you know, short-term and long-term performance of your stock. So um, I think perhaps paired with economic conditions, though, it is just market volatility. Um, which makes investors more risk averse generally, which leads to mo lower market demand and can reduce uh, kind of those valuations that you're seeing. And I think you can also often with both of those see, uh, you know, companies that are going before you potentially having unfavorable or, you know, underperforming outcomes. Um, which means that your IPO down the road may get postponed or delayed or, or some such. So um, from a company standpoint, those kind of macro conditions, from a company standpoint, I think we often see delays just because of overall company readiness. And, and I think of several aspects there even. We've talked about financials. Um, and again, those should support the equity story. When it doesn't, that generally means there's poor performance in the company. And I've seen even recently my own clients delay IPOs because of that, um, where it's just not telling the story that gets to the right multiple. Um, you may have negative news uh, around your company, maybe just issues around negative operational issues or management turmoil. Um, you know, in the last five to 10 years, you've seen some really interesting management uh, stories. There could be, you know, I don't know, fraud that occurs, you know, anything like that surrounding a run up to an IPO is going to delay an IPO um, or at least at minimum affect the valuation. Um, and, and you could even have, you know, macro industry trends that maybe there's a shift away from a specific industry. Uh, energy, for example, has come under fire in the last, you know, call it five years, 10 years, um, although it's certainly had its ups and downs. Um, and I think, you know, a, a, a really big one as it comes to the company specifically, um, we, we often say a company should prepare to be public, not to go public. And I think what we mean by that is you really need to address back office issues. So, um, Liana mentioned, you know, your corporate governance. Do you have good governance established? Um, have you addressed accounting and reporting topics, topics adequately? So um, on that, I'd say it is much better to correct accounting issues before you go public within financial statements that the public has never, never seen than after you flip public and then you have a public restatement, which is much more costly. Uh, from a valuation standpoint. Um, someone mentioned, I think Tara or Liana may have mentioned, can you close your books timely? Can you do that in 10 days or so? And if not, you may fail to meet some of those shorter reporting deadlines, like 40 or 45 days to get a 10Q out the door. Um, if you do miss those deadlines, it doesn't say much for your company. And can that, that can certainly devalue your shares um, and potentially delay uh, an initial filing. Um, you need to have the right controls in place. You need to consider an internal audit function, um, not necessarily required, but could uh, be something to hold uh, delay an IPO. 
Um, I've seen systems even, uh, even recently, you don't have the right systems in place that can postpone an IPO. Um, recently had a client that postponed their IPO so they could implement a new ERP system and, and get that information in order. Um, and similarly, a, a management reporting platform. So, um, you know, do you have the right KPIs? Do you have the information to feed those KPIs? And do you have a history of that information so you can tell your story? Um, if you don't, then you, you're going to need time and you may need to delay your IPO. Um, and the, the only, so I, I'd say, okay, back office, you need to get all of that information right. Uh, you need to get your house in order. The other thing that I think changes a direction of an IPO, and this may be not a delay, but whether or not to IPO is often companies will do or dual track their exit process, mm -hmm. uh, meaning they will simultaneously pursue an IPO and a private sale. Um, so the returns of those two avenues are, are quite different in some cases, um, but some may, ref uh, I guess, prefer to remain private. So um, obviously, if you take that route, it's going to change your outcome. Um, so I, I've seen that as, as well. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Jack, um, what does the day of IPO look like? Um, and any, you know, specific case studies or examples that you might want to share with the group? Uh, yeah, I I mean, in addition to doing these uh, boot camps and meeting incredible entrepreneurs, uh, probably the best part of our job at NASDAQ is uh, the IPO day. Um, we joke it's honestly kind of like your wedding day. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe better. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you fit it all into that, you know, 24 hour period? But Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so and, and so with that, we really um, take the time, not, not only through the process of understanding, you know, what day, they want day one to look like, but also kind of post IPO and, and leverage our marketing team. We've got a, about 95 people there in New York that are you know covering not only the event itself, but social media, PR, um, also just kind of the logistics of getting everybody there. We can uh, accommodate a few hundred people. Some of the bigger ones, monday.com brought about 400 people there for their IPO day. Um, and then some have more muted ones. So it, it's really, we can uh, customize it to fit whatever that the company's uh, focus is and, and desire is for that day. And I think, um, you know, the case study, the one that jumps out to me, which was a really fun one just last September was ARM when they went public on NASDAQ in September of, of 23. Um, you know, a pretty global company with their headquarters in Cambridge, an office in Sunnyvale and several offices around the world. So they ended up having about 75 people there in New York with their executive team and, and board. Uh, their respective families are great pictures with the executives up there with their kids at the podium. And obviously, then you go out to Times Square, we've got all the signage there. Uh, but specific to ARM and, and for a lot of companies with those global offices, we actually helped them throw a huge party uh, at their headquarters in Cambridge with about 1,200 people there. And that was all branded around for ARM and for the IPO day with their ticker symbol. And then we had the video feed so that Renee and Jason specifically, Renee, their CEO, and, and Jason Child, their CFO, were able to uh, make some opening remarks or remarks throughout the day to the employees really make it feel inclusive even though they weren't in new york they were having the celebration there and then were able to see what was going on in new york not only for the bell ringing ceremony but then also there's kind of a second party if you will uh which is around the first trade so it takes about an hour and a half for most deals to actually build that book and that whole process to uh to actually opening the stock for that first trade, and then you're off and running as a public company. So we do a lot of curated content throughout that. And then also we've got a full broadcast studio there. So Renee, Jason, and also Masa son from SoftBank were able to conduct uh, probably a few dozen interviews. They were very busy that day, uh, as you can expect, but just meeting with the different media outlets, um, all from the, the studios there. So it's uh, we kind of say it's your day and we have a lot of best practices and 
kind of share what others have done to get creative, but we we throw ideas out and then Tara, we lean on the marketing teams and kind of the, <laughs> the but right I will, side. Might yeah, I will good. say, I will say that um, NASDAQ, the team um, in my personal experience, it's unbelievable how you can not just focus on the New York, you know, what's happening in the NASDAQ at Times Square, but include thousands of other employees in real time to create that um, excitement day one. And then also just the incredible long tail. So I know selfishly as a marketer, I've been able to work with NASDAQ to extend media buys. Um, it's not just Times Square, it's digital marketing it ends up being digital brand awareness. Um, and it is, it's an incredible framework and, um, and team to leverage large team. But I mean, I've seen that long tail go for at least, at least a year post day one. So, um, yeah, thanks for that. That's a fun question we could talk about all day since I'm a marketer, yeah, no, but thank, thank you. you. <laughs> um, Leanna, um, how do regulatory requirements such as those imposed by the SEC impact the IPO process? Oh, and the short answer is they drive the IPO process. <laughs> uh, but I will say before I dig into that question, I will give one quick plug to the NASDAQ rooftop deck that they have right above Times Square, which is also very, very cool in terms of the, some of the events they have. Um, you know, but I will say that the SEC in the last two years has done a surprisingly high volume of rulemaking. Right. And I would say it's almost unprecedented in terms of how many real new requirements they're putting out there. When John Michael noted that, you know, climate just got put, you know, held. And so we're going to see where that comes out. But, you know, the clawback rules, insider trading, um, frankly, even some of the board diversity, which is more exchange driven, like there's a lot of changing landscape in the actual requirements. And so it does mean that you need to be nimble, paying attention, kind of reassessing your disclosures, making sure you comply certainly you get a warning that it's coming, right? So there's often a long process and there's a little bit of when will the shoe drop, right? The comment period has ended. We know what the draft rule looks like. When will it be released? And then when is it effective? So you have time to, to get up to speed, but there's been, I think, a, a fair amount of just activity and changes to the requirements. Um, I also think that different commissions will focus on different issues. And, you know, I am sure every law firm you were talking to has their hot button SEC issues, right? And um, you know, I think they maybe change in order. They're usually roughly the same, but the SEC will tend to focus on certain things or revisit certain issues from time to time. And that can very much drive your disclosure requirements. Um, metrics is something that is just traditionally always, you know, an area of focus. But you know, I had a company where our account examiner really didn't like the metrics we used. And we had, you know, multiple turns on the comment letters. We had multiple phone calls with them to understand what their concern was. And we took it out at the end of the day because we couldn't quite get them comfortable um, with the presentation that management wanted. And so that really then can shape your message. And for that company in particular, you know, they felt that that's how investors looked at the business. And that's why they wanted to talk about it that way. So once we can't talk about it, it actually affects your roadshow deck, right? It affects... Your, your IR engagement and how you're messaging some of the business and how you answer the questions you know are coming, but you've been told, I can't give you the data the way you would like to see it, right? But here's an alternative where you can see the components. So I, I do think that that regulatory regime does drive a lot of the process, not just from a timing perspective, but really what how you get to sell the company in some ways. Um, and then certainly I think the industry, right? Um, you know, I, We've had companies who are sensitive to some of just the regulatory back and forth, right? Like who is in the spotlight right now? Who is sort of politically on the out and, or what industries are, what are they, you know, do we have congressmen writing letters and does that affect your timing, right? And your expectations for how much scrutiny you will get. And I think the SEC is not in the business of keeping companies out of the markets, but they are in the business of making sure that there's fulsome disclosure, right? So if they see an issue or, you know, they will probe and they will say, tell me what consideration you've given to talking about this and where and how, and not just generally, but I want a very specific disclosure. And so a lot of that, um, I think very much can shape the process and we'll get questions of, do we have to say that? And like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, that that actually leads into, um, you know, a question I'd love to offer open up to the group just because, you know, this has been fantastic. Thank you for everything. Um, we've got some great questions 
lined up at, you know, due to time constraints. Um, for the group, I mean, do you have any examples of companies that have had like either a tremendously smooth um, journey from that roadshow to the bell or any that didn't go well um, for our attendees today that may have a takeaway or, you know, something that quickly comes to your mind from um, examples of companies um, that, again, have either gone smoothly or not? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'd say, Tara, honestly, it was a lot of what we covered. I think, um, you know, rarely do we see companies launch the roadshow and then pull. I mean, that, that's, you know, very, uh, very few. It, it certainly has happened for a variety of different reasons. Um, but it's usually before you're going to go, even with, with a S1 publicly on file, you'll just, we've, we saw this a bit through 2022, had a lot of companies that were ready to go. However, the war in Ukraine broke out and they decided to, to just stay on file, update the uh, the filings on a quarterly basis and just kind of bide their time. Um, so I'd say, you know, the decision to go or not go uh, typically is made before the roadshow. Um, and I'd say for those that have done it smoothly, it's a lot of what we've discussed here. They They're just ready. Uh, they've taken the time, they have the story, they have the interest. Uh, a lot of that book, as you think of those investor meetings or even meeting the roadshow, they've met with those investors five, six times, especially those long only or those large uh, long onlys or asset managers. Uh, so when they get into those meetings, it's kind of like, hey, great to see you again. Let's dive right into some Q&A. Give me a quick update. And it's a 20 minute conversation as opposed to kind of a pitch meeting and let me really make sure you understand this. So I'd say that's probably for those that have gone really smoothly, it's that prep work and really having that story locked in and that engagement with the investor community that's led to a very smooth roadshow and therefore smooth IPO process. Yeah. I mean, Terry, your question is uh, that's a fairly narrow window between the roadshow and bell to that point. I think, what comes to mind for me is that, the, and this wasn't your exact question, but I'll say it anyway. I, I think what's traditionally view, viewed as a successful IPO, quote unquote, is, is based on the performance of the share price very close after IPO. What happens day of or within the, the first week? And I think you've seen a lot of success stories over the last three to five years, um, Airbnb, um, Rivian. Um, Snowflake, those all popped. And so, okay, great IPO. Um, you've also seen some really challenging IPOs. We were Peloton, um, you know, others. And I, I would say to the group that um, you need to nail the time, well, the 12 to 18 to 24 months leading up to your IPO, you need to nail the roadshow. But things don't always go to plan. And the success of your IPO not only depends on initial performance, but long-term performance in the public market. And so there's a lot that you can do to, regardless of what happens in the first week, ready the course or ready the ship and, and stay the course and create a, an overall healthy company that is, is a really positive uh, force in the public market. Yeah, so I know folks love to hear war stories, so I will share two quick ones. Um, and they are almost always third-party driven, right? I mean, as everyone said, this is kind of a narrow window. You've teed everything up. Um, you know, the first one is probably that first week of your org meeting, you're going to get a publicity presentation from us lawyers that are talking about the do's and don'ts. Um, and when it can come back and bite you is right at that end. And so we did have a company where, you know, the CEO had given an interview to a small industry publication two, three months before, right? Mm -hmm. They put out the article, just so happens, right? We're, we're all teed up. And some of the metrics were quite what we had said in terms of the TAM and our growth, right? And so it was a little bit of this, do we backtrack, right? We, we have to put out there a call of correction. Are we actually gonna take this article now and put it into our S1 and essentially adopt it? So okay, everyone, this is out there, right? So, you know, it certainly didn't affect the roach overall, but there was this extra layer of how do we manage that Right. And I do think the corollary to that is, you know, it was mentioned earlier, you're going to have all these interviews the day that you ring the bell. 
let, be on message, say, say the same metrics, you know, make sure you know what metrics we put out there, which ones we said can't say that. Because <laughs> we've also had retractions, right? Of like the day of pricing, your CEO goes out and says something rounding, right? To be clear, what we meant was Y or Z. Then the other piece, which was unanticipated, um, is lawsuits, right? right. And, and I think it is something that is hard. You cannot always anticipate it, right? But we had someone where we, we didn't expect it coming, but it was large enough, right, that we felt that it needed to be disclosed. And now you're trying to think about how to message that, control that, get ahead of that, you know, on all real time, because you're actually on this timeline, right? So one of the beautiful things about the roadshow is it comes at the very end, right? One of the hard things is you can't move it. Like once you kind of file publicly, folks kind of know when you're expected to do something. And so if you deviate or you delay, that can create a lot of questions, right? And concern. And everyone assumes delay is bad, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so really managing the, the control and the marketing around that, you know, so the first one you can control, right? The, the publicity, the interviews you're giving that sort of who the mouthpieces of the company are, we want to have that sort of tightly managed, making sure you're going through the right processes. On the latter, that isn't something necessarily that that you can get get your arms around in advance. But these sorts of things do tend to happen. Well, that that sort of yeah, that sort of tips off on um, one of the submitted questions because I do think you know um, managing and and your executives with the larger personalities, as Jack had just mentioned, you know keeping them on script and consistent and, um, you know, doing as much preparation as you can. in I call it that IRPR realm to prevent any big surprises, you know, anything you can control. Um, but, you know, someone asked, how should we communicate the IPO to our employees and address potential concerns and ensure they remain engaged and motivated after the company goes public? I think we just talked about, you know, how the price might, you know, go up on day one and then how to manage those expectations. I've loved one time I had a CFO who communicated with our employee base often about how stocks typically do trade and shared in workshops. You know, um, these are people's livelihoods. You know, they like to wake up in the morning and then look at the stock price Um and then when something, a lawsuit happens, you know, how do we, how do we, how would you advise people communicate um, the IPO, you know, when it's happening and that day one um, with employees around their concerns? Yeah. And, you know, most IPOs for tech companies are almost as employee driven, right? As, as company driven or third party driven in that sense. It's a big branding event. It's a big milestone. And so I think employee comms are a very, very important part of the process. Um, they usually start at the public filing, right? And there's a couple series of comms. There's the, yay, we're going public. And what does that mean? Right. Then there's the, please don't talk about it. Or please, you know, route questions or comments to the IR team. And then I think there's that sort of operational, what next? What does this mean for my equity, right? How does my compensation change? What's now publicly out there? You know, what am I allowed access to? Or can I not talk about anymore? And now we've got, you know, MNPI and blackout, you know, periods, those sorts of things. But I would definitely, um, most companies almost always want to get ahead of it, right? The question is, can they keep it, you know, is it the best known secret in the company from org meeting to public filing, right? Which is often three months time. And so... It's definitely something you want. I would. I don't need to, need to get ahead of it. I would encourage it, right? It's a core component of the process, right? And, you know, your IR function should care. Your HR function should care. Legal should be involved. Um, I think what is important is vetting the messaging because often if it's HR driven, for example, and they've not been involved in any of the other work streams, right? They may say something that's slightly off, right? Um, where I do get concerned about folks is promising valuations, Right. Don't worry, those options of yours of five dollars are going to be worth it. Like those types of statements will get you in trouble, right? And so we do need to dial back some of those promises about valuation or value of your shares. But otherwise, I think we generally encourage once you're legally able to, I right, post public filing, right? Very much encourage engaging with folks and answering questions where you can. You know, a lot of companies do put out a press release at the confidential filing, and they say, "Hey, we have confidentially filed." And we can't say anything, but at least I put out this press release. So now I can tell all of you, right, that this has happened and I can say that. And that's actually often a very strategic employee driven move 
Um, mm -hmm. There's some component to the dual track that John Michael mentioned, but I'd say most of my companies do it because they need something to tell employees who kind of have heard the whispers. And so that's also one way of just saying, you know, here's when you're going to get more information. But we've started a process and now we're in this regulatory regime. Yeah, one thing I'd add maybe um, with regard to keeping employees engaged, I think it's important as you're getting closer to your IPO to design a compensation package for not just your ex executives, but your key employees that will compensate them fairly for a public company. You want them to stick around. They're a key element of making your business successful. And so um, you can properly design a compensation package with incentives that are perhaps more linked to those shares um, that'll maybe provide them in some incentive to uh, remain with the company. Absolutely. And as Lee Anna had said, you know, HR typically isn't brought in, you know, um, and um, when you think about, you know, people and compensation and incentives, um, it's it's woven into everything. Um, I think we're at time. I'm not sure, um, Nicola, but um, I think I'm two minutes over here. <laughs> oh, no. Well, what great discussion, Tara. And uh, we had a little buffer because we had a planned break. But uh, Jack, right. Liana, John Michael, Tara, uh, let's round us out. What's one key takeaway on the uh, from based on this discussion? And Tara, I'm going to include you on this one because you have experience here and I'll probably I'll start with you. But one key takeaway on the executing your IPO process. Um, my key takeaway after a couple IPOs in retrospect is that day one can be so beautifully orchestrated and have a halo of at least 12 to 18 months with your partnership with NASDAQ and your investor community. If you, you know, if you have the luxury of 24 months, use every single month, every single day in the back of your mind to think, how will this affect the S1, right? Will that customer approve with Wilson Sonsini when they have to make the call? They have to call their counsel, right? And I had that happen one time and the whole S1 was held up by Caterpillar and they ended up giving the approval, but you know, I really wanted that customer in my S1. Um, so my key takeaway is the more you can prep and keep, you know, a lot of people culturally don't like to talk about IPO, right? It's like, let's not get everyone in the company fired up on the IPO because it's a day in time. But as an executive of the company and a leader of the company, always have it in the back of your mind. Amazing. Jack? Uh, I think you nailed it there, Tara. Um, I think we discuss so much that goes into this process, not only the first panel, but specifically here. And you heard from legal and on the finance side, uh, investor relations, marketing, right? Every business unit um, and department is going to have some input on getting the company ready to go. And, and I think what's lost on a lot of companies or executives going through this is everything we mentioned is feels like a full-time job and it kind of is. I mean, you've got a lot of support here, uh, but then you also have a full-time job and you have to execute to plan. You have to manage your org and your team and your people to ensure that they are executing on the mission and the plan. So it becomes a lot. So back to giving yourself enough runway and executing and preparing to be ready uh, is just going to end up, uh, you know, alleviating the the sprint that is once you get the green light fantastic advice john michael yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna echo preparation is 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 paramount um i think the you know the old adage is true if you fail to prepare then prepare to fail um don't underestimate the time that it takes to to work through those organizational efforts and and I think we've talked about this 12 to 18 month window, even longer, if you have a very diverse business, maybe a disaggregated footprint, lots of international operations. And when I say disaggregated, if your information, your systems are disaggregated and you're now having to gather that information together for concise analysis, it can be very daunting. Um, so allow yourself the, the time to create a cross-functional team plug in the right leaders, um, 
you know, hire the right professionals to come alongside you, whether legal, accounting, uh, your underwriters, uh, and be thoughtful in your approach. I know there was a question about, hey, if you don't have time, what do you cut? Well, I'd really challenge that question and say, okay, how can you put a really thoughtful approach into whatever time you do that? And yes, maybe there's some things that you need to take out and handle uh, through uh, hiring professionals, perhaps to um, you know handle that for you, but really think about the things that you can do. It's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of time. It's probably going to be costly, uh, but be thoughtful in your approach and you can minimize those challenges as you go through. Great advice. Liana, round us out. Well, I want to underscore what Tara just said, right? Preparation doesn't mean open a data room start working on risk factors, right? But what it does mean is start thinking about your organization and what will have to be disclosed, right? And the framing of what story you're going to tell, right? And I do think that can be very helpful. So that really huge partnership you contract, you just inked, is that a material contract that we're gonna have to file, right? And does that make a difference to our business? Cause it might, you know, um, that big founder loan we were going to do, do we have to disclose that as a related party transaction? Is that going to look really bad? And so maybe it really isn't worth it. So I think IPO prep, right, can be scary because there's your giant work list, but all these things you could do. But I do think it often dials back to operationally, how are you running the company, right? Where are the places you need to gap fill? And what are you doing with an eye towards how that's going to then play in that process overall? Uh, wonderful. And to such a great discussion, Tara, Liana, Jack, John, Michael, thank you so much thank you. for contributing your first day and experience today. Thank you. Absolutely. All thank right, you. team, please join me in joining our next special guest for our next session. We've got Bobby Bartlett, who is a professor of law and business at Stanford Law School, and Steve Bachner, who's a partner at Wilson Cincini and a board member at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. They're going to provide a quick fireside chat on good board governance for pre-IPO companies. Steve, Bobby, so good to see you. Steve, over to you. Great. Thanks, Colin. Um, and I think I see Bobby there. Hi, Bobby. Hey, Steve. Bobby is a, uh, Bobby's going to handle all of the hard questions on our fireside chat. He's co-chair of the Rock Governance Center and a Stanford professor on business and corporate law. So it's a real honor to be up here sharing a fireside chat with him. Um, we we have 15 minutes to talk about governance, um, and we could probably spend a couple of hours, but we, we decided to talk about three uh, topics that hopefully give you some practical advice and some takeaways. The first is, is some thoughts about board composition, pre-IPO company board composition. The second is some IPO considerations re relating to board effectiveness, and the third, is uh, assuming we have time is some recurring pitfalls and perhaps ways to mitigate them. So jumping into to IPO board composition, I'm gonna mention a few things and then um, turn it over to, to Bobby for a couple of thoughts here, but maybe just, just um, following uh, some of the final comments of the last panel about board, uh, about preparation for an IPO, uh, board composition certainly falls into that category. If you think about it, a lot of board members don't want to just come on board um, and then sign the registration statement and move on. There's a courting process. And, and I think 12 months is not too early to start thinking about your board because people want to get accustomed to the business. There's a recruiting process. You don't want to be at the 11th hour and having to find an audit committee member, for example. So certainly when it comes to board composition, planning is is key there. And I think a good way to think about it is maybe starting with, you know, where do you need to be uh, being a public company and then where you want to be. Uh, and, and where you need to be has a bunch of different um, uh, sources of criteria. One, of course, is the exchanges and the SEC dictate that you need to have a majority of independent directors. You need to have an audit committee and a comp committee consisting of independent directors and people with the right expertise. And, um, and there's diversity requirements both under state law and disclo diversity disclosure requirements under the exchanges. So uh, doing a skills matrix is not a bad idea for a pre-IPO company. Just, you know, where, where are we right now? Where do we need to be? And then, you know, from a skill set, regardless of where we need to be, where do we want to be? You know, do is there 
Are we missing somebody in marketing? Or do we have the right finance folks? Do we have uh, somebody who's an expert at AI, you know, or enough of them? And, and that those kinds of questions. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a good way to think about it. But independence doesn't really stop uh, there, Bobby, because because Delaware has had a lot to say about independence, uh, particularly in some recent cases involving companies like Tesla and Match, and 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 those don't necessarily mesh or follow what the exchanges and the SEC think of as independence. Yeah, I mean, the way that I often think about it, and when I talk to founders, and I, I work with a, a, a lot of founders on campus, and so they're, of course, at the at the very early stage of their their companies. But, you know, the, the, the issue is, is that when you form a, a company, of course, you know, you're forming typically a Delaware corporation these days. Um, and that rule book sticks with you from the day that you incorporate where you may be the only director through the day that you go through an initial public offering. And so what's interesting is that the shape and the, and the governance needs, the shape of governance and the governance needs will evolve uh, largely pragmatically over that over that time period. And so, of course, you know, when you when you are the founder and it's your company and you're the only director and the only stockholder, in some sense, the rules don't matter that much. There's not just not a lot of risk. But as you as the 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 composition of the board and the shareholders starts to diverge, then you need to start to pay a lot of attention to sort of the, the rules of engagement that Delaware sets forth that sort of layers on top of what the exchanges provide as well. And so as you evolve from this private company through the more mature private company to a public company, the, the need to comply with what Delaware is saying about what's good governance, especially these days regarding what constitutes an independent director versus a conflicted director becomes really, really important. And on this question of, of independence that really becomes very important for more mature private companies and of course for public companies, the issue often relates to the fact that within your board of directors, you're going to have people who are gonna be conflicted if the company is proposing a particular transaction. That could be compensation, it could be a related transaction with your venture capital back, uh, backers, for instance, because those investors are likely to be contractually on your board as well. And so the, the concern that Delaware has is that, well, when the board is transacting with someone who's an interested director, and it could be because you're getting a financial interest as a director that's not shared with the other st stockholders, or because you're investing in the company and that's something that's not shared with other investors, then there's gonna be a lot of scrutiny on whether the board is independent and disinterested with respect to that interested party. And there's this idea that, well, independence means, uh, you know, like as, as long as I'm not the founder voting on the founder's compensation, or if as long as I'm not a venture capital investor invest it, voting on, say, a preferred stock financing, I must be independent and that's sufficient. And it turns out that is not, not the case these days. Because what the Delaware courts have been saying is that it's not so much an independence test, it's a disinterested test. And they look at disinterested really broadly. And so they say things like, well, look, if there's a controlling person on that board, so Elon Musk is a, is a great example, but it could be sort of any founder that has a lot of stockholders, or it could be sort of an investor that has an outsized influence, like a 51% stockholder position, or has other sorts of like indicia of just being really influential. Um, then it turns out that, that that's a, that's a uh, company with a controller and anyone who's beholden to that controller because they have really close personal relationships or there've been cases where like, you know, the, the, the children of a director plays on the same soccer team as the controller, you know, that's enough to make that person beholden. That, that turns out that person can't be disinterested. And, and these days, the idea is that you need to have basically a group of, a group of committee that's entirely 100% disinterested in order to have that transaction kind of get the blessing of what's known as the business judgment rule uh, in, in, in Delaware. And if you don't get the blessing of the business judgment rule, then there's this chance that later on down the road, some stockholder could bring a claim that says, oh, that, that transaction was should be invalidated because it was, wasn't properly approved. Yeah, I think the, the really interesting thing here is that how, how far the Delaware courts have taken this potential disinterestedness or lack of independence. So a lot of pre-IPO companies have boards that might actually satisfy much of the NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, or SEC independence requirements. You know, they're not 
employed by the company. They don't have officers. You know, you, you, they don't, there aren't officers who are family members of, of a particular board member. They're not getting paid enough to be to not be independent. But things like plain ownership, as you said, you know, being on, on soccer teams, social relationships. And this is something I think is really uh, can, can be missed in IPO planning, which is not only asking your, your legal counsel, hey, will we satisfy the SEC and NASDAQ requirements? But, you know, if we get in front of a Delaware judge who's alleging, you know, some breach of fiduciary duty because something went wrong um, that nobody anticipated, Will we be? Will this board really be viewed as independent? And in that context, it might not. They, your 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 directors, which look independent because they're venture capitalists and others, might not really be independent when viewed by the Delaware courts because of these social relationships or business relationships. And I think that takes people by surprise sometimes. So I think that's a that will leave you with that kind of planning tip uh, that independence has has a lot of tentacles. And the Delaware courts have moved pretty far in, in examining those, those distant relationships and expanding what we normally think of as independent. So the next topic we were gonna talk about is board effectiveness. And um, one of the things I do is, is um, uh, this is actually a fun part of my practice is I do board evaluations for public companies, self-evaluation. So I get hired to, to do that. And I'm often surprised by you know, the the, fir the first board evaluation post IPO, I'm surprised by some of the comments that come out that you'd think would get vetted early on. Some of those are, we spend way, ch way too much time doing PowerPoint, not, not enough time with discussions. We, we don't do the agenda setting the right way. We're not happy with how the, the meetings flow. And so I think our, our practical tip here is, while you're still a private company, you might want to think about asking your board, maybe doing a self-evaluation while you're still a, a private company. And, hey, how do you like our meetings? Um, are the right topics being addressed? Are the agendas setting, getting set correctly? Or is there enough time for discussion? Do we want to start? You don't need to have independent sessions as a private company. Maybe many um, venture back companies start to do that as a best practice. As a public company, you do need to have independent sessions, meaning without without uh, management present. Um, so those are some of the things that that um, that I hear in these board evaluations. I think to have an effective board, you got to feel like those board meetings are well constructed and um, and ask those questions in advance. Steve, on that note, too, I mean, do you have any thoughts on sort of when you think about the board? Sorry, book? Bobby, go ahead. Yeah. When you think about the board book that gets prepared, like how, how what are some of the, the differences that you've seen from sort of the companies that were private and then they make the transition to being publicly traded companies. What are the expectations around what needs to be provided to board members in advance of meetings um, for, in the newly public company versus a private company? Ooh, looks like we may have a Zoom moment. Let's see if you'll come back on. <laughs> Sorry about that. He has a much better answer to that question than I do. But Bobby, you might want to hit him again with it. Yeah, I was just asking Steve uh, about what do you see in terms of the difference between the, the board book that needs to be prepared for a public company versus a, a private company? What are the sort of uh, sort of suggestions that you often provide in terms of how that, that documentation changes? The, the board book itself? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I think that, that um, certainly there's a lot, there's a lot more required kinds of things there in terms of, you know, 10Ks and disclosure committees. So there's lots of that, that that goes on. I think in terms of the substantive business content, you know, I think that doesn't really change. You know, the boards want to do a deep dive in the business. Um, but I think my main point would be, you know, ask your board in advance, where do we want to be? What do we want to can we start dry running what those board meetings, what those board packages look like? I think one of the things I, I do see uh, with public companies that are well counseled is, a, is more awareness about how those board packages are constructed because all of those are typically discoverable in litigation. So if you've got things in your board packages that, um, that uh, present different risks for example, or different types of disclosure, the plaintiffs later can use that against you and say, well, you told your board this, 
uh, we see this in your board package and your minutes, and that's nowhere to be found in your public filing. So why was it important to tell your board, not your public investors? So you want to be really thoughtful about how things are presented once you're doing public board packages and minutes for that matter. That actually leaves us maybe a, a good segue to the last uh, topic we have just a minute for in terms of uh, sort of the, the some common pitfalls in terms of board governance regarding both pre-IPO companies and post-IPO companies. And, and I, I think one of the, the issues that often comes up is um, is this this need to think about what we think of as oversight duties. Um, they need to have you know some sense of the boards have a responsibility to have some sense of what are the mission critical risks that involve our company and how are we ensuring that problems on that reflect that that domain sort of come to our attention and then of course if there's red flag you need to act on it are there sort of how, how do you typically advise boards in terms of being sure that they're discharging their oversight duties well i think a simple way to think about that is you know you, you do you do a lot of work preparing risk factors in your in your sec reports and you may do a lot of work in your enterprise risk management discussions among the board but if your board minutes don't reflect that risk that that, that those risks as having been discussed i think that really creates uh problems later in litigation for example if you know if if you've got um regulatory risks that are presented in your 10K and obvious with your business, but your minutes are devoid of them for a discussion of those for a year. I think judges will say, well, you know, you, you said these risks were really important. It doesn't look like the board addressed them at all in the minutes. And then you're really backpedaling and having to say, well, we did discuss them, but they weren't in the minutes. And so I think that's one of the vulnerabilities, you know, self-inflicted wounds of not you know, not not at least reflecting periodically in your minutes the very risks that you disclose as real risks of the business. I think we may be, uh, Colin, I think we may have, have hit the... Uh, you hit the perfect mark. Thank you so much, Steve and Bobby, for sharing a little bit about good board governance. You two are the pros here, so really appreciate your time and for joining us. Thanks for inviting us. All righty. Well, on to our final panel of the day, Achieving Success as a New Public Company. We hope the information provided by our experts so far is timely and valuable, and we look forward to staying in touch as your growth continues. All righty. Let's move on to our third panel of the day. Without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our next panel of experts. We've got our moderator, Nicola Corzine joining us back. She's the CEO and Executive Director here at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. We've got Andrew Vogel, who's a principal at KPMG. Welcoming back Dan Angus from Panel One, who's a Managing Director at NASDAQ. And we've got Andy Gilman, who's a partner at Wilson Sonsini. Looking forward to it. Nicola, over to you. Thank you so much, Colin. And uh, welcome to our incredible experts joining us today as we think about not just a point in time, such as an IPO, but what happens after. It is a continual journey, obviously, as we've been talking about since the very beginning of our first panel today. And on that note, I can't think of three better experts to help us in discovering how we can do that successfully and disseminate some of those best practices through some great case studies and some insights today. Um, so as before, what I'm going to invite our panelists to do is include a little bit of their background, perhaps in the first response that they share to us in our prepared questions. We're going to have about 45 minutes or so today together in prepared questions. Questions, and then we'll spend as much time as we can in live Q&A. So if you do have questions as we go through, please make sure you use that great Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Hop in questions and we'll try to get to just as many as we can. So Dan, I'm going to invite you uh, to join us back first again on, uh, on our stage today. Um, let's talk a little bit about the fact that most of the best experiences come from looking at other people's experiences when it comes to how to be a great uh, success story as an IPO company. So as you include a little bit about your background, could you perhaps share some of those stories of inspiration from those that have paved a happy path ahead of us uh, so that we can learn from what it takes to really live a great life as a publicly traded company? Thank you, Nicola. Um, good to see and uh, have everyone participate today. My name is Dan Angus. I'm a managing director at NASDAQ's in the new listings and capital markets group. Been in the role for 10 years and work with private growth stage companies in helping them prepare and eventually launch 
as uh, an IPO and publicly traded company. So one of the first things that I think about for those companies that have done very well <clears throat> um, in their life as a public company following their IPO, um, I think no better examples come um, from anywhere but you know 2021 and the companies that still persist and thrive uh, because this that crop, as many of us understand and know, um, in 2022 and 23, in particular, there was many challenges that um, these companies had to work through. And it's through what I've distilled down as maybe a couple of best practices um, that helped them stay afloat and continue to thrive. And one of the first elements that I've seen for public companies who do well post IPO is prior to, let's say three to six months beforehand, they develop a plan that is in concert with other members of uh, the executive team in terms of engagement with customers and marrying that to engagement with investors and then subsequently analysts and the media. And I, I mentioned that <laughs> order because that's generally where the companies have the most lift. They identify a milestone or some element of uh, customer satisfaction or achievement, which then is packaged and prepared in discussion with potential investors or existing investors, which is then moved into a highlight for um, you know, the sell side and then possibly added to either industry analysts or the media as something that they should take note of as well. And it becomes a virtuous cycle of that yields to another customer interaction, which then yields another institutional investor behavior. That's an ideal cycle. And what companies have done to reinforce that is uh, three to six months prior to IPO, they say, all right, within the first year of us going public, these are the days, this is when we are going to report. Previous to that date, this is when we're going on an NDR. Previous to this date, this is when we're having a customer advisory board or something similar where they aggregate you know, stakeholders um, or customers. And then this is, you know, this is the day that we start whenever that happens to be. And so they are very intentional on a quarter by quarter basis, and they are very consistent with what they do. Um, the, la the one thing that you just, as a public company, I think everyone would agree, you want to stay away from variability. Being as consistent in your actions and how you report and how you engage is really paramount to making the market overall comfortable with when you say you're going to do something, you're going to follow through. And so uh, the first thing I'd say, Nicola, is just really that intentionality behind scheduling and thinking well, well, well in advance post uh, IPO. And that, of course, will lead to that growth outcome that everyone hopes for. So that it's not just a moment of a high, but it's sustained a great performance, obviously, in, in the yeah. aftermath of this. Fabulous. Um, well, Andy, welcome. Uh, we're delighted to have you join us today. Thank you so much. Um, speaking of aftermath, perhaps not the best of words, but obviously there is a lot of stress that comes out. You have the high of the high, and then there's the prolonged, ooh, I didn't see that one coming. What are some of those um, watch out tips that you would encourage or advise management teams and investors and advisors joining today to just be mindful of in the aftermath of the actual IPO. And again, please do include a little bit about your amazing background in the introduction too. Thanks, Nicola, for having me. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Andy Gelman. I'm a corporate securities partner at Wilson Zitsini based out of our Palo Alto office. Uh, I advise companies across the life cycle from the very early stage private companies through mature pub public companies. Uh, really uh, look forward to talking to you all today about one of my kind of favorite parts of my practice, which is that transition period that, you know, post IPO, IPO companies go through as they transition to become going public. In terms of the challenges that the companies face, I think, you know, as, as, as Dan kind of alluded to here, being prepared is paramount because no matter kind of how much you really prepare, it's, it's, it's a whole new world as soon as you kind of, you know, you, after your first day of trading, you are a public company now, and you have to live in that world of being a, being a public company. I think the probably the biggest challenge that all companies face is just that adjustment to the reporting calendar and the disclosure requirements that go with that. You companies go from this world of primarily focusing on the business to suddenly uh, being you know subject to this whims of this ticking clock that happens every quarter, and having to meet those earnings targets that you set out instead of just having to explain it to your board, which is what a private company would do. Um, 
and and getting those filings done, uh, the 10Ks, the 10Qs, the 8Ks when when current events happen on, on the cadence that you're required to as a public company. Um, I think starting early to prepare for that, uh, you know, including doing practice earnings calls, uh, you know, before you're a public company is one of the ways that companies can prepare for that. But no matter how much you prepare for it, I think the mind share that goes to that uh, that cadence is, is hefty and, and is something that a lot of a lot of executives have to get used to. What kind of goes hand in hand here with the regulatory or with that, that reporting requirement is also kind of what we've seen over the last two years in terms of the SEC's uh, heavy rulemaking. You know, a lot of companies could be prepared as they were in 2021 to go public. Uh, and then suddenly the SEC has kind of shifted the goalposts in terms of what to be pre prepared for as they continue to adopt a new regulation. Another area that I see as kind of a, a challenge is around governance. A lot of our you know, pre-IPO companies have a pretty closely held structure where you're able to you know, operate pretty nimbly at, at the board level. Uh, and an IPO you know, immediately builds in layers of control into the organization, whether that's the formation of committees that may have not been in place prior to, to IPO, uh, that, that makes it a little bit more uh, uh, structured in terms of how a company operates. And so getting used to that and being prepared on that is really important as well. It's a little bit later in life, but as companies mature, uh, activists also can potentially become an issue uh, and in terms of having how having to interact with them and and run your business around around you know what you expect from activists is, is, is another issue there. And I think the last thing I'll touch on is I think one of the first uh, questions I get are issues that is raised when I you know start working with a company thinking about going you know doing an IPO uh, is transparency. You know oftentimes companies are extremely transparent with their employees pre-IPO. Uh, something that they pride themselves on. Uh, and while you know, employees are always a, a stockholder of the company, uh, becoming a public stockholder uh, comes with it a lot more issues, including you know, insider trading considerations. And so figuring out that right balance of uh, you know, how to uh, you know, keep, keep your employees in the loop without running into insider trading issues is, is another issue that companies are focused on and how to kind of rein back uh, before IPO the amount of information that is, is shared to your employee base. Such great insights, Andy. And again, if you ever, anyone here ever needed a reason to not go it alone, uh, you know, make sure that you have this incredible treasure trove of, of advisors who are guiding and supporting you each and every step of the way, as I know all of you are thinking about. Um, I, transparency, um, a, a topic that has already been raised. Andrew, I'm going to come over to you because I think in, uh, in, in many regards, the complexity of different stakeholder groups that you have to keep informed and think about uh, with life after the IPO includes investors and, and being transparent with them, but also realizing the story is unfolding in real time. How do you encourage and advise management teams to sort of engage with uh, the investor group as a stakeholder in an ongoing basis that allows for that transparency to really be at the, at the forefront while still realizing you may not have all the answers uh, as uh, as you're just now are making this transition to a publicly traded company. Thanks very much, Nicola, and, and lovely to be here with everyone as well. Uh, my name's Andrew Vogel. I'm a uh, principal at KPMG. Um, I'm based out of Los Angeles. I support many of our clients uh, in, a, in going through an IPO process and specifically getting, um, you know, the operations right. Um, there's, there's this team here has, has spoken a lot about preparation and, and certainly loving to help assist our clients in getting the right operating model and the right reporting and governance um, ready for our clients to, to be to be ready for day one readiness for IPO. And I think that, Nicola, ties right into the question here around managing investor expectations and transparency. And I think first and foremost, it's all about communication. Communication is absolutely paramount and ensuring that you have the right internal process to be able to communicate to the market uh, is probably uh, you know paramount um, uh, is really is really paramount for for many of our, our clients. Um, so you know you have to establish trust in the market. So that's consistent communication around the company's vision, strategy, financial results. Um, this could be done in a number of forums around um, annual general meetings, press releases. Um, uh, uh, you know, 10Ks and 8Ks and all, all of the various um, documents and components and outlets. So um, establishing the right process to communicate yeah, is really important. That delivers trust and that builds trust with the investor community uh, and the market. Um, the second one around transparency is, is, is just crucial. So all material information 
good or bad. Uh, it's really important to get a handle on that and to communicate that to the market. Um, consi having consistent and transparent um, uh, communication, that once again leads to trust and transparency in the market. And that's how the market sort of uh, you know, invests um, and, and builds confidence with, with, our, with our clients. Um, uh, another sort of point around that is around being predictive. I think we all know that that markets are forward looking, and so being able to have the right um, I'm going to use this term sort of fairly frequently um, operating model internally to be able to deliver forward looking and predictive information is really important. How that gets communicated to the market, um, obviously balancing sensitive information, not giving away, away all of your trade secrets. Um, but being um, uh, on the front foot with the market to, um, you know, generate interest and ha uh, have investors sort of come on board is is really important to developing you know that trust and that transparency as to how the the business is going to be going. Um, feedback feedback as well. We're talking about that transparency and managing investor expectations. Feedback is a two way street. So. Companies being re uh, receptive to, to both good and bad information is really important um, and having that right environment internally to be able to, to digest that information is critically important. And, and to do that, you have to have good governance. Uh, that, in, that includes having you know, a, a strong and robust board of directors, uh, independent directors, not just you know, company executives. Um, you know, Shameless plug here, KPMG, you know, it's all about, you know, getting a right control framework. So having robust control environment, you know, strong audit relationships as well, um, doing all of those things and putting those structures in place uh, enables companies, once they go public, to have a great investor community, um, have, um, you know, forward-looking, predictive um, results, having a, a well-structured communication plan, and that's how you develop trust in the market. Yeah. Yeah. I, Andrew, I, I love everything that you've said. And I think it really touches on, you know, in some ways what Andy was sharing and, and Dan shaped earlier, it's a mindset shift, right? So as you've gone through this journey, now this is, this is a daily life that you're living and breathing. And so thinking about it, not just as a deadline of a, I got to do a filing on this moment in time, but really building up that muscle mass of how do I do this on an ongoing basis so that I have the confidence of this key stakeholder group with the investors trust, and that I'm communicating with them regularly and that they're seeing and, and really Realizing the story is unfolding as I've been telling with the right controls in place. So excellent. Thank you. Um, okay, speaking of communications and the complexity of stakeholder groups, obviously investors are a key one, Dan, but they are not the, the sole stakeholder. We're that easy to a certain degree. Um, when you think about the wide and varied stakeholder uh, groupings involved in sort of open communications of a publicly traded company, what do you think really go into making healthy communications? Who are and what are some of those tactics that really unfold in ongoing communications of a, of a public company? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I whenever asked either this question or a variant of it, I, I generally think about the board. Um, I always remember back um, sitting in the audience of one of these conferences earlier on in my tenure at NASDAQ. One of the panelists had uh, relied, relayed the sage uh, wisdom of, you know, the, the people uh, who could fire you remain on the board. So make them happy and keep them happy. Um, and so I always believe that in the process of doing, you know, or achieving that goal, uh, you also have to be um, super intentional and focused on that goal when you have a key milestone like an IPO. And it's not just beginning then, it's more so the process of for those board members that matter or investors, you know, soliciting their input on IPO timing, uh, gathering consensus well before you have a board meeting to confirm the timing um, of an IPO or solidify or approve the fact that you're going to go in process um, and, and having those conversations early. Another, you know, element that uh, one area that you, you might have to deal with it is discussing valuation um, with investors and board members prior to IPO. Perhaps it'll be flat to the last round. Perhaps it might be less. Maybe it'll be more. But the point is, is that the earlier that you develop this ability to have frank conversations 
with board members um, about these topics um, and, and do the small things, um, the easier these harder conversations, you know, will be in the future and the easier, you know, keeping them up to speed on IPOs will certainly be. Um, you know, the, the other component, strangely enough, is having a mentor that has gone through the process, whether that's as a CEO, CFO, a CRO, um, anyone, right? It, it's anyone in the C-suite has a counterpart that's gone through this process. Um, you know, finding someone that you can just speak with and experiment with ideas about how you would go to market or ways of positioning the company prior to or following IPO so that the first <clears throat> volley about how these new strategies might adjust post IPO don't go directly to the CEO for example and you know a bad suggestion at a critical time could reflect reflect badly you know you want to try this out with a peer not just subordinates so i would say creating your own uh, board of directors, personally, <laughs> as you go through this process of mentors that have been there before, um, it, it's very helpful. Um, th the last thing is communication with regulators. Um, <clears throat> I spoke about this on the last panel, but just to reiterate, like these regulators are often, um, whether it's SEC, FINRA, et cetera, they, they are often overworked, overloaded, and very seldomly heralded for the good work that they do. And so with that in mind, you know, taking an, el an elegant approach to how you interact with them, understanding and, you know, authenticating and, and, and you know, acknowledging that they are doing a lot um, will definitely help you as you go through the comment process, let's say for the SEC, or you're dealing with other nebulous regulations with FINRA. Um, it, it's, it's a humanistic process, regardless of who you're speaking with. And so approaching it from that end will definitely help you, but definitely pay attention and, and, you know, make sure to focus, uh, on developing the best relationships with regulators as well. Mm, I love coming back full circle to the idea that you are investing in the relationships, not just in the transaction. And as we think about building trust and confidence with stakeholder relationships, that's so key. So critical. Thank you, Dan. All right, Andy, um, not everything is always in the good camp of life after going public. Not everything's always in the bad camp of life going uh, public. So when you think about sort of the pros and cons or the advantages and disadvantages, how do you help a, a management team really weigh up? Is now the right time that I can embark on this? What are some of those critical considerations that you'd offer for them as they think about making this transition? Thanks, Ikla. And I think I will start with the benefits on this one because I spent most of my time talking about all of the challenges and problems that you have when you go public. Yeah. And I on the, on the last question. So, uh, in terms of benefits, I think uh, number one is uh, greater access to the, the financial markets. I mean, I think as, as a baseline reason why a lot of companies go public is it opens up the door to raise primary capital in the in the public markets through you know initial through the IPO itself, follow on offerings, or you know other types of transactions uh, that 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 become possible at that point. Um, another reason uh, uh, that I think is, is particularly prevalent right now, actually, um, is you know a lot of companies were, were thinking about going public in, in 2021. There was a huge backlog. Um, and now we're three years later, and there's you know th their employees have equity through options in our shoes. Uh, and through that equity, um, they are subject to an expiration date, which is anywhere from seven to, to, to 10 years. And so if you're thinking about going public in 2021, fast forward three or four years, we're starting to bump up against that date now. And so getting liquidity for their employees is probably top of mind uh, for a lot of these later stage private companies that, that have been holding out. And unfortunately, you know, staying private, there are not a lot of great options to, to, to deal with those issues without entering the public market. Besides employees, investor liquidity, uh, you know, obviously, again, you know, these VC funds potentially have invested six plus years ago at this point for, for a lot of these companies, uh, given the given the window that we're in, and, and are, are probably a little bit antsy to, to, to get some liquidity um, at this point as well. Um, last one I'll, I'll, I'll flag in terms of, of benefits is just credibility and brand recognition. You know, I still think there's this aura of, of, of a public company, I think, in terms of communication with customers, if, you know, if you're public, there's a pretty good chance you're not going to disappear. You know, a couple of years from now, in terms of your your if you're if you're provided to, to to customers, employees, you know, look at it as an opportunity uh, to have you know liquid equity 
um, and, and partners as well. And so I think there is still this credibility and brand recognition of going public that I think is important. Now, uh, you know, I've kind of touched on some of this, but there's obviously drawbacks. Otherwise, everyone would would go public. I think one of them is uh, is 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 frankly cost and regulation. Uh, alluded to this previously, but you know, entering the public markets make you subject to this SEC regulatory regime that is constantly changing, um, adding layers of of cost in terms of uh, employee base to help you know develop the controls and structure in order to operate as 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 a public company. Um, is, is, is part of, of, of being a, a public company. Um, earning cycle is, is another uh, drawback. Um, you know, this, this kind of constant focus on short-term results uh, by having to file, file a, you know, your, your, do your quarterly earnings report with, with your investors and always having to focus on how to get to that, that next place instead of being able to more easily focus on kind of long-term results. Um, again, as, as, as companies mature active, this pressure also becomes a, a real, real concern um, as well. Uh, the last one I'll touch on is legal exposure. Uh, when you become a public, you know, when you go through the IPO process and you become a public company, um, you become subject to more frequent uh, securities law claims. Uh, you have potential liability under the federal securities laws for material misstatements or omissions. Uh, and that is constantly lingering in the background from the time that you go public um, until, you know, through, through, through the rest of your life as, as a public company. And unfortunately, in, in a lot of these degrees, disclosure is looked at uh, as if hindsight is twenty twenty. So people will be combing through your, you know, when your stock price drops, people, you know, folks, uh, plaintiff lawyers will be combing through your uh, your disclosure, trying to find something that that may have been inaccurate that could have could have driven that drop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Andy, thank you for that. And again, if ever there was a reason to make sure that you are armed well with people that oh. can help you navigate both the good, the bad, and the ugly of this. It's, uh, it's those insights, so thank you. Andrew, um, the 2024 report has just been released from KPMG around the market conditions. Obviously, we hate to say it, but timing is everything. And I think it's certainly on the minds of everybody these days when it comes to um, now, wait, later. Uh, Andy gave us some good insights into like why that ticking clock it does have a limit of expiration that we all need to be mindful of. But what are some of the more nuanced elements of helping management teams and investors in this winter that we have been under start to think about when is optimum timing and how do I mitigate the risk of uncertainty and knowing just when to go? Yeah, no, great, great question. And and timing is everything. And that report, by the way, came out today. Uh, I so, know, just like hot off the press. We could have so, asked about the time for Anna, that. thank you for um <laughs> for uh, posting that in the chat. I um I frankly it's 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 that confidential. I actually haven't, haven't quite had a chance to read it myself. Um, but it's it's available for everyone out there. Um look, timing is everything. And and I think if you take one big step back and you look at the IPO market and, and the SPAC market over the last couple of years. Uh, timing what, what was uh, a very important factor in the success of many, many companies. We looked at what happened in the SPAC market in 2019 and what's happened to many of those, um, sorry, companies that went through SPAC, what, what happened to the sort of the performance of those entities from 2019 onwards. Um, uh, we've all learned probably a, a pretty good lesson from that. And, um, and similarly, we're seeing, we're seeing that today as well. Um, I sort of reflected on another KPMG report around our sort of um, winners and losers from 20, uh, 2023. And what was interesting from a tech perspective, I think it was of the six of the 22 IPOs that were in the tech industry ended the year in positive territory, which is kind of pretty interesting considering how strong tech was as an industry last year uh, in broadly in the overall market. So um what that also says to me is that industry is very important, but having strong fundamentals of your business model uh, are equally important in this particular market. Strong balance sheets, strong financial performance is, is really important. I think um, one of the key trends that we're seeing, and, and obviously it's sort of the hot button topic of 2023, 2024, is AI and how uh, the next big wave of IPOs are expected to be with AI as its core focus. So it's, you know, Without you know going into specific names, but you know that next wave of sort of you know open AI and other companies in that space are uh, expected to be that 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 wave. And I think Nicola, that comes back to the question: is jumping on the right macro trend? And I think if you're in the right industry, if it's AI, if it's green tech, and you're coming off the wave of the Inflation Reduction Act and the other sort of incentives that are out there in the market, 
um, they're the important trends to look out for. Similarly, it's important to keep to keep your eye uh, on on the broader trends. If it's you know geopolitical risk, um, and you see what's going on in the eastern Mediterranean and the, the flow and effects of oil and what that can do for inflation here in the U.S. economy, keeping you know the Fed coming out this week and saying you know rates you know higher for longer. Um, and so, what does that mean for companies operating in the space to to get capital when interest rates are at um, you know multi-year highs, uh, as we all know. So I think they're, they're the sort of big macro factors. And I think what, what it's come down to with many of our clients that I'm seeing is you've got to have a strong balance sheet. Um, it's important to tap into your investor base. And one of the one of the items that, I, that, that I'd like to mention is making sure that you've got the right investor base um, that understands your long-term strategy and balancing that off uh, is really important because they're the investors that you can get access to capital with and get your timing right. Um, timing is is very hard. We all know that. It's it's hard to pick uh, timing in the market. But, um, you know, getting the right base ready, understanding the market, that's going to ensure sort of a, a better chance of success um, when, you do, when you do go IPO. I love that. I, I, I want to stay with you for a minute just because, it's a question that we were going to raise a little bit later, but I think it, it does touch so nicely on the insights that you just provided, you know, short-term versus long-term strategic mm-hmm. goals and and sort of how do you balance the trade-offs in thinking about what to communicate, when to communicate in market moments or otherwise? I, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, I'm sure there's not a one size fits all answer that one could ever counsel to a management team. But what are your recommendations in sort of building up that narrative for publicly traded companies and thinking of those two sides that need to work cohesively together? Yeah, that's right. So there's a, there's a couple of threads there, Nick. So the first one that I've mentioned that previously is just having very clear communication. So you want to be able to be out there in the market and clearly articulating what your longer term vision and strategy is. So that's about balancing the long term and and ensuring that I just mentioned previously, that your investor base understands your strategic vision. If you can build the right investor base, then that's going to ensure that you've got the right amount of capital invested in the business. Um, But then again, we all know that the market and what you know is that on a three month, um, you know, the results have to be sort of communicated, you know, every quarter. So getting that balance right um, in terms of um, short term results, with the broader term strategy, uh, you know, is is really important. How you do that, uh, that can be done in a number of ways. I know, I know the team here just mentioned around your, your 10K and if there's an 8K that needs to be filed, absolutely. Um, there are other measures as well. You know, a balanced scorecard uh, is something we all learned probably many years ago back in our, our schooling days. But, you know, a balanced scorecard could be a very effective method in communicating both long-term and short-term results. Um, we all know that it's no longer just shareholder um, engagement uh, and management, it's stakeholder engagement and management. And there's much more to companies these days than just maximizing profit, um, given everything that's going on from an even an ESG and an environmental and a broader stakeholder community aspect. So, so being able to clearly and articulate what you're doing for broader stakeholders is really important. Um, we spoke about, you know, touched upon um, great, and, and strong uh, board governance, um, and having a, a strong board of directors that understands the complexity of managing both long-term and short-term um, decisions is going to be very important. Um, and then I'd say maybe just the, the last piece there around balancing those needs is is um, having um, a very robust um, finance function in place and a, and a robust FP&A process to have uh, Internally, to be able to know what your five, 10 year plans are, but then having a very important and robust budgeting and reforecasting internal process um, with the right tools and the, and the right enabling operating model internally so that you can then clearly articulate what that looks like for the market. I think that's really important. That's a lot of work, by the way, to get those processes and those tools in place um, and getting the right data uh, is hard. But, but once you get those foundations in place, then it's a much easier decision to know what do we want to communicate, by the way, to the market uh, from a short-term perspective, but also to our investor base for our long-term strategy. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It may be a lot of work to get that balanced scorecard in place, but I think as you've alluded to, one, you're not doing it alone, and 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 two, there are a lot of tools and techniques out there to help you achieve that on an ongoing and, and consistent basis. And so maybe on that note, Dan, I, I'm going to invite you to sort of share some of those strategies, some of those tools, some of those technologies that are actually making life as a publicly traded company more possible um, in the pursuit of, of the art of ongoing success. Um, so what are some of those things that obviously I know NASDAQ directly makes uh, available, but also uh, others that you're inspired by what's coming out in the industry right now to, to help companies in this moment in time? Geez, it's a big, uh, it's a big question, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um... I think that the first place that I always land on is uh, having a strong or foundational investor relations program. Um, ultimately, a company needs a database of record for their investor interactions and what their peers are doing, as well as filings and uh, transcripts, et cetera, like all, all of the data that would encompass the investor relations universe. Um, NASDAQ has a platform that you would receive for free for three years upon listing on the exchange. Um, it's called IR Insight. Uh, but there are a few other competitors in the field as well. We tend to think that we like ours the most and uh, it's the best one, but um, definitely go out and look. The, the, the operative message is that you, you have to have a central repository and um, guide as to how you... Uh, execute on your investor relations strategy. Uh, the other component is um, a board portal. You know, what, what's interesting, a board portal by way of background is um, a software platform that allows your board members, your um, general counsel, your external counsel to basically collaborate on uh, board materials, decks, voting, um, UWCs, um, all of the board processes um, that are required for effective uh, governance is it can be centralized in an encrypted platform that basically serves as an efficiency optimizer. Um, the other component of that is a directors and officers questionnaire uh, module that typically the directors and officers questionnaire process is, is a tad manual. Um, you know, external counsel will go to all of the board members and uh, receive their signature and just valid verification that all the material information is still correct and relevant or getting that on the, the first instance. And that process can take time. Um, it's a game of telephone and email. What this directors and officers questionnaire software will do is bring that into a more automated uh, setting and drive um you know, engagement to those board members well ahead of time, it should actually reduce the cost structure of that operation as well. Um, the other element, um, you, you know, really just to help with internal operations is, you know, some type of Workday-esque platform. Um, it's, it's amazing just how quickly human capital will balloon um, post-IPO. Um, and tracking that and ensuring there's, you know, a level of compliance with the state as well as federal, you know, it's, it, your organization will grow so rapidly, um, in the lead up and following an IPO that this is sometimes ignored, but the, uh, state and federal authorities will not, uh, ignore you as you get your name. Uh, put on every paper and uh, website in the world because you're going public. Uh, so this is something that, um, you know, really just keeping uh, an eye on and, and engaging a software that helps manage the human capital component. Um, you know, the, the the last thing, and this is not so much a uh, software, but just on the capital market side, um, having an understanding or your team having an understanding as to what a stock transfer agent does um, and how they can help with investor relations. Uh, sometimes there's change of control, um, projects or events or milestones that happen where, you know, the shareholdings of particular investors, you know, can't be mapped correctly and it might change 
is designation and you need a stock transfer agent to clear that up because your IR team is getting inundated with a lot of questions that they can't answer. So, you know, stock transfer agents, much like NASDAQ, we are considered plumbing and plumber, so to speak. So sometimes it's really good to know um, what your plumber does. And so I'd recommend that. Um, otherwise, there's a litany of other softwares and, and systems and protocols that you can adopt. But those are the ones that I've seen as being the most helpful. Yeah, excellent. Excellent, Dan. And again, I think I think the recommendation would be somewhat start early, at least in exploration, and make sure you do have that peer mentor that you advise for earlier who can help you see around those corners and really know when to prioritize perhaps adoption of some of these things to accelerate um, and, and help ease the translation of going from a public, from a private to a public company. All right, Andy, last time you gave me glass half full, I don't want to put you in a position of doing glass half empty. However, the question needs to be asked around, you know, managing common mistakes around managing shareholder uh, expectations once you are a publicly traded company. And, and obviously, most importantly, managing ongoing performance of stock price. What are some of those challenges that you've seen um, anecdotally at large that have emerged, whether it be from litigious situations or otherwise that present themselves as, you know, an important component to the ongoing life as a as a publicly traded company? Thanks, Nicola. I think, uh, I think the the analysis here really even starts before you go public, and that's that's managing the growth story for for the company. I think any company, really, most companies that are going public around now are, are and, and and we're going public in the you know 2020, 2021 boom had a really high growth rate, and it's uh, it's no matter you know what company you are, it is difficult to maintain that growth rate over time as the company gets larger and starts to scale. And so I think a big part of it is just managing those expectations and setting it out clearly um, out the, at the time of the IPO and beyond uh, so that you don't catch your investors off guard. Um, I think that, you know, the litigation is inevitable if you start to drop um, and the price drops with it. Um, but setting expectations and on the legal side, including risk factors that lay out those expectations is really uh, key to, to keeping yourself protected as, as the company proceeds along the, the public company route. I think kind of relatedly to that on the growth story is choosing the right key metrics up front um, that you continue to disclose and guide to as you become a public company. I think it's often the case that, you know, when, when key metrics are selected, you know, the company is sitting around a table with the bankers and they're trying to figure out, and the lawyers, uh, and trying to figure out, you know, what makes the company, you know, presents the company in a favorable light, um, or is maybe similar to, you know, other perceived successful IPOs, even though that's not necessarily how management looks at the business. And that might be okay at the IPO, but if you're, if you're using a metric that's not really how you look at the business and how you want to you know, talk to investors, um, there's going to be a point where that doesn't really make sense uh, and you start to run into issues. So I think taking the time up front and finding that right metric, uh, those right metrics uh, will help with the issues of managing shareholder expectations and being in a place where you're guiding to metrics that you're able to uh, to, to, to predict and, and, and meet on, on a go forward basis. Um, I think third, uh, this, this is something that, that Andrew already spoke to was kind of managing balancing short term uh, with, with the long term. Uh, and I think something that we've increasingly seen since 2021 is this increased focus on profitability uh, rather than just growth. And I think it creates this conflict in some cases where you're, you're taking steps to reduce costs that don't necessarily maximize long-term growth. And so I think there's always going to be this balance of figuring out what, what you want to focus on now and figuring out how to how to balance that on, on you know, as, as a public company will be a, a quarterly and annual ongoing decision that the company will be making look for. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more. And I, and I think it dovetails nicely. I've got a couple more questions that I'd like to sort of pose to the broader group and then Hang with us, everyone. We're going to get to those questions that have been coming in fast and furious in the Q&A. Thank you so much for that. You still have time. So if you have a couple that you'd like to get to, now is a great time to pop them in. Um, but but let's stay there for a moment. We, we, we've all talked about the fact timing is everything. Nobody's got a crystal ball, sadly, unless anyone wants to raise a hand and offer it up. 
Uh, you know, I think I think the question then comes, what are some of the strategies that you do encourage management teams to think through when it comes to the ongoing tensions that live between what is communicated, what we set as priority around our stock performance and, and, and who we're really trying to get excited about the story that's still unfolding and none of us really have uh, have 100% certainty on uh, on any day of the week. Um, so I'll open it up to the group, but, you know, we just encourage you, you've all worked with exceptional management teams. What inspires you from some of those management teams that you've seen on how they manage market uncertainties? And 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 obviously, <laughs> this is this is one of those, uh, if not one for the records. Um, I, I can jump in first. I think uh, I, I've. I've had some good uh, sage wisdom from some founding teams that uh, kind of they take it, their policy is take a contrarian view to whatever the stock price is. Um, and so what what do they mean by that? So let's say on the first day of trading, uh, your stock is not doing well. Maybe it broke price. Maybe it's flat. It's not the 25, 50, 75 percent, you know, rocket ship that everyone anticipated. These things happen. Um, one of the items, not only on that day, but on an ongoing basis, and I think this is incredibly key for internal discussion, is having legitimate conversations with your team about, or rather your employees and saying, this is long term. Don't look at the stock price. Don't go on CNBC.com. Lose your um, you know, E-Trade app. You know, do whatever you need to be to divorce yourself from our stock price because first off, in the first six months, you can't do anything about it anyway, and you're locked up. Then after that point, you know maybe you would like to sell, but uh, doing that will invariably like make you want to check and potentially access that liquidity even more, which is fine, but it will cause stress because there's short-term volatility and long-term upside. And just reminding them them of that repeatedly over time is is paramount um, just for employee retention and care. Um, when it comes to investors, if your stock is not doing well, you know this it, the the framing of it is this is an opportunity. You know this is an advantageous price point for you to enter and uh, you know if you're not going to do it, someone down the street might. You know, here is the opportunity for you, Mr. and Mrs. XYZ investor. Um, that's a position that these companies have taken in the past before. Now, it, interestingly, like if the stock is doing well, you know, then it depends. It, it, it's 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 arguable whether or not this approach works uh, because of the sophistication of typical board members. But uh, having and setting an expectation as though whatever level of elevated you know price performance that you're experiencing, when you're speaking with your board, telling them effectively this is the best that's going to get, you know, and not so much in those words, but rather saying like you know, aren't you happy, grateful, thankful, you know, that this is you know happening under your watch, you know, as opposed to you know really bemoaning the fact that you're not five or ten percent higher. Um, it, you're trying to temper expectations at all times, all the time, uh, in regards to your stock price and performance with, you know, all different types of audiences. The, the, the just the general framework that the individuals that I was alluding to that gave this kind of advice was these executive teams would always err towards the side of making their audience more calm. You know, not too high, not too low, just even keel and doing that consistently over time, which makes the need for them to interject and, in, you know, themselves more into employee discussions or investor discussions, you know, to talk about that um, makes the need much less frequent. Um, so just trying to keep an even keel is generally a good idea. Mm -hmm. I, I will call a throwback moment from panel one of inspiration that you shared earlier. You know, this is this is a long term game for sure. And so caring for the well-being, uh, the overall ability to, to stay the course 
is a critical function of that and and the investment of being knowing when to sort of separate oneself to to be able to stay the course is so important and then surrounding yourself with sort of that health and wellness aspect um is is key too and also the fact that this is a sales process of sorts too so you know having the ability to look at it through that lens and 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 find the sales approach inside of you of saying yes this is a great opportunity. Somebody is really going to be leaning in and, and and having a great day because of it. So I love that, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to add anything as far as moments of inspiration from management teams that have inspired you on strategies they've applied? I think as a general matter, I think, um, you know, keeping an open dialogue with the board around what's going on with the business um, is is incredibly important. And, and also just open and transparent disclosure uh, in your, in your, you know, securities filings. I mean, keeping the Keeping the investor community apprised of, of, of what's happening and what you're expecting uh, will go a long way to one, you know, create not creating a situation where there's unwelcome surprises, uh, which, you know, inevitably, if the business is not doing well uh, and it's clear, uh, then the, the stock price will eventually, you know, go down regardless of whether you try to hide the ball or not. And so keeping, you know, keeping good disclosure uh, and, and, and another plug for risk factors here, including disclosure and risk factors. Uh, will also help in, in kind of the aftermath of if, if in fact the you know the the, the bad news comes to pass and, and the stock price ends up dropping. Yeah, yeah. Disclosures are everything. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for that. Well, as much as we uh, don't like to talk about stories that didn't have the happiest of endings, nonetheless, everybody that reads the papers every once in a while will go, hmm, wonder what happened there. Uh, not to put anyone in a spot of naming names, but I think, you know, everyone does want to learn through the lessons in many ways of others that have had challenges in uh, finding the right window or telling the right story. As you'd encourage our uh, community who's joining today and, and those watching and listening afterwards, what are some of those best takeaways that we can apply not on on the shoulders of anyone that has suffered but sort of in in support of making sure others don't have to go down that path anything that comes to mind as far as avoid this don't do that or if i could encourage anyone to do something make sure you do this well i'll start with this one look i think it, we, we've touched upon this previously um and maybe i'll answer it in a sort of the, the other way is just prepare well but but get the right governance in place in order to avoid those pitfalls so do the things well have a very strong robust set of internal directors that we've spoken about your sort of your core team around you to make sure that you have a great board of directors to steer the ship um, doing those things well will help you avoid those pitfalls because they've been through it they've seen through it inevitably we've all gone through ups and downs in our careers and um, they're the sort of wartime stories that you probably want to know to watch out for um you know we spoke about the sort of the pop after day one and, and sort of the def deflation of your stock price after that what can you do to avoid that well probably have you know liquidity and have uh, be ready for a contingency plan and as dan suggested take a contrarian view to your own stock price and th they're probably the things and the experiences that you need to know from a a trusted team around you to avoid nicola the, the pitfalls uh, i think there's no sort of magic uh magic answer to it but i think um you know doing the the small things the one percent is right um will inevitably lead to overall success i think the other thing that we we wanted to mention we spoke about communication out to the market to incentivize teams not to sell not to go back to that question but internal communication is is, is really important not just with the board but how you're effectively communicating to your team because if you want to retain the best talent, you've got to have clear and, and concise and direct communication. Um, they're the things that want to ensure that you have the right people around you to, to take the business going forward to avoid sort of the ups and the downs. Yeah, I love that. I was uh, at a symposium in DC last week and there was a very poignant statement that was made of probably no single silver bullet, but there's certainly a thousand silver pellets that make it all possible at the end of the day. So thank you for reminding us of that, I think, in, in these moments and times. And then again, yes, surrounding yourself by those that have those experiences by working with a trusted advisory group like those represented today so that you have you know, decades of experience that you're leaning on. It doesn't just have to be the summation of those on your management team alone or around your board alone. There's other ways to get that help and that assistance. All right, I've got one last question before we go to some good uh, Q&A from our audience today. And it's a, it's a good one. Of all the things that you have wisely shared today, I'm gonna ask you for one more. What is one 
key takeaway that if you want everyone to leave today thinking about, encouraged to do, doing something differently, whatever the case might be, what's your takeaway that you want them to remember? Uh, Andy, I'm going to start with you. Then, Dan, I'm popping over to you. And, Andrew, you're going to round us out. So, Andy, you're up first. So I think what I would say is there's a lot of excitement when you get into the IPO, and it seems that everyone's attention tends to turn to the execution of the IPO, getting it done, which is great. It's a really exciting transaction. Everyone's trying to get that to the finish line. I think sometimes what's lost, lost sight of is that you know day one after you price, you're now a public company, and you got to be prepared for everything that goes with that. So I think we've talked a lot about preparation and making sure you're prepared and putting the governance in place. I think it's just really important to spend the time during the IPO process to focus on the public company life, not just the IPO itself. That includes reviewing all those pesky policies your outside counsel like me will send your way uh, that tend to kind of get brushed aside into the last minute. Uh, and so spending the time to think up front will, will go a long way to success as a public company. Dan? Yeah, I um, I really like the approach that companies uh, do when they are on the cusp of going public uh, two, three, four months out. Um, or maybe earlier, and they start, you know, looking out on the horizon and communicating a future goal. Because uh, your employees are generally going to think that this IPO is a goal in and of itself, which from a certain vantage point, perhaps, um, sure, but it's really not. It's just the morphing into a more sophisticated organization. So the best thing you could do as a leader is, you know, not with a heavy hand, but rather, you know, subtly, but consistently is start identifying detailed and tangible goals that you want them to achieve post IPO. Is it, you know, hitting and exceeding and meeting earnings, you know, for six, eight, nine straight quarters? Is it hit, hitting a certain, you know, revenue rate? Is it taking down a particular competitor? Like you need to move them into a similarly passionate goal uh, beyond an IPO, which can whip up so much emotion. You need to find a surrogate for that so that there's not a letdown after the fact, which is an actual real thing. And it could have some adverse uh, repercussions on the business. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you, Dan. Andrew. Yeah, I'm going to round it out to something I touched upon earlier, which is get the operating model internally right. I know that's sort of my world, but I, I can I can assure you that, um, you know, ensuring that you've got the right structures, the processes, the reporting, the enabling tools and the technologies and the governance, getting all of those things right is probably, from my vantage point, one of the most important things you can do to give yourself every chance of success. Excellent. Excellent. Well, speaking of best chance of success, we've had a couple of questions that have been popping in, really asking for your guidance and advice on you know, how to deliver bad news. Not that anyone wants it, but it is sometimes inevitable. And sometimes it's completely outside of the control, like a key executive is leaving or something has happened right before an earnings call. Rather than get hyper-focused on the bad news delivery, uh, what they're asking for is like recommendations on, you know, how to get ahead of that. Is it something that you would advocate for of disclosing uh, via a press release? Are there any ways that you've seen that have helped to soften bad news or honestly, uh, make it seem that it is part of a story, perhaps, but not the be-all, end-all of the story. Um, I don't mean to be crass here, uh, but another really good piece of advice that was given to me is if you're going to eat crap, don't nibble at it. Um, you know, really just, and I think that's the same with the markets, because what's going to happen is that for every leg down, you experience due to bad earnings, et cetera. Again, there are going to be buying tendencies and behaviors that pick you back up in hopefully the not too distant future from that point. So I don't think that there's anything, first off, you want to try to avoid telegraphing or front running any news anywhere at any time. Um, I think everyone can agree with that. So that is off the table for somehow softening the blow. You can't even allude to the potential of certain things happening if they actually do end up happening shortly thereafter. So the the best approach is to really you know take it the bad news and then really just turn up as a leader your effort level and intentionality and in moving past that uh, because there's nothing you can do about it and um, you know you're just focused on execution at that point. Mm -hmm. 
But the only thing I'll add is just overall, and there's more nuts and bolts here, but in terms of timing of releasing kind of bad news or, or, or you know, an executive transition, I would try to time it where you have an opportunity to speak to your investors. So whether that's in connection with an earnings call or during an open trading window, I think it's important if you're going to put out news like that, you want to have an opportunity where you can immediately have a conversation with your investors uh, in a FD compliant manner. Uh, so you can talk through it and, and be able to, to to answer questions to the extent that they um, that they come up. I agree that there's no sugarcoating bad news, but I think you know one of the things that you had mentioned was executive transition, and sometimes that in particular can be a a, a growth story that you're telling. Uh, that's not necessarily bad news for for a company, um, and and can be part of a, a broader story that you're you're trying to convey. Yeah, great, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, staying with that for a second, I I think you know people are curious. We've invested so much time leading up to this in the relationships of the investors. What do you guide or help people to think through when it comes to the ongoing maintenance or relationship building with investors, knowing that hopefully this is just the start and not the end of investors that get excited about those growth stories of newly traded and uh, newly public companies? What are some recommendations that you have on investor maintenance and investor expansion uh, for publicly traded companies? I'll start this one off. Uh, I think I touched upon it earlier. It's trust. It's trust. I think in order to do that, you have to yeah, you just have to be very clear in building a uh, a trustworthy um, set of uh, communication to the investor community. And I think do, doing that and putting out predictive results and achieving them. And when we see it all time and time again, how many times do we see that these the companies out there, you know, the big oh, we'll talk big tech for a sec. How many times do they exceed and beat, my, you know, earnings? Uh, almost every time, it's almost unusual to hear of, of big companies not uh, exceeding uh, their earnings. So, I think doing those um, once again, doing that on a consistent basis and developing trust with the investor community is only going to be able to provide, um, you know, further leads and a further sort of broadening out of the base of your investors. So. Um, that would probably be the one um, one takeaway I'd give on, on answering that one, Nicola. No, but Well, friends, our time has come. It went quickly. It always does. And this was no exception, obviously, thanks to the incredible conversation that our panelists have led today, their insights. If you haven't read the recent report, obviously, it's hot off the press. So please do make sure you download for the questions that were coming in around what's happening with industries or sectors or where do we set our sites. It's a lot of great intel in there. Um, but to our panelists, truly, thank you. It has been an honor. Uh, and I've learned so much today. Deeply appreciate each and every one of your time and intel. Intelligence. And Colin, back to you to close this out for today's session. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Nicola. Great job at facilitating discussion. Andrew, Andy, Dan, thank you so much for contributing your time and expertise. For everyone on the call, hopefully this was insightful and helpful as you think about your trajectory to potentially an IPO. We'd love your feedback. So if you're interested in meeting with our partners, please take a moment to complete that survey in the chat box. And we'll make sure that you can get in touch. And also, we're launching a poll in case the chat isn't your style. If you missed any of these sessions or you want to rewatch the videos, these this content will be available to you on our YouTube page. So use that chat and the link to subscribe. But after a long, long day of boot camping from all of us here at the center, we thank you for joining us. And we look forward to welcoming you all back online soon. Have a good one, everyone.